So good evening each and every one of you. I hope everyone is safe and sound and doing extremely well. This is Baswaraj. I'm your biology master teacher. Okay students, hope you're able to see me and hear me. If you're able to see the presentation behind me and if you're able to hear my voice, a quick thumbs up in the chat or blue hearts, green hearts, preferably green hearts in the chat and let me know in the chat how each and every one of you are doing. Students, are you able to see me? Check, 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 sound check and the video check. Are you able to see me and hear my voice? If yes, a quick thumbs up in the chat and we will start today's amazing class that is Biomolecules. Now students, while we wait for everyone to join, let's wait 10 seconds or 20 seconds for everyone to join. Let me ask you a simple question. The simple question here is, what is the difference between DNA and RNA? A simple question, right? A simple question is, what is the difference between DNA and RNA? Anyone? Good evening each and every one of you. Good evening, good evening. Can anyone in the chat tell me what is the difference between DNA and RNA? Now we have some smart kids, right? Some we have some smart kids who will tell, Sir, uh, DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. And someone will say RNA is ribonucleic acid. Yes, you will say that. But students, that is just the full form. What is the difference between DNA and RNA? Now some of you will say, Sir, in case of your DNA, we have thymine. But in the case of your RNA, we have uracil. Yes, those are smart kids. But there are ultra smart kids who know the structure. That is, that what is that structural difference between DNA and RNA? If you know the structural difference, that is the difference in the sugar. That is, in the case of your DNA, we have deoxyribosugar and in the case of your RNA, we have ribosugar. Now students, what is the structural difference? Don't worry if you do not know, because in today's video, I'll be teaching you every single detail from biomolecules. All the way from the basics to the advanced level. Yes, all the way from the basics to the advanced level, we will be covering every single line of NCRT, every single previous year question last 10 year questions will be including so students all you need to do is all you need to do is hit the like button right now and watch till the end that is the only thing i always ask you please watch till the end of the session because some of you students who you start the session now then you leave the session in the midway then you'll be like sir i'll watch the session later on but do not do that watch the session till the end because this is going to be a very very long session this is going to be a very, very long session. Okay, can we start? Can we start the class? Let me refresh. I'm not able to see the chat here. Can we start the class? If yes, give me a thumbs up in the chat. I will start your biomolecules. Okay, can we start? So, all of us know the structural difference now, DNA and RNA. So, students, before I start, before I start the session today, I want everyone to like the video because the reason that always we ask teachers, why do you have to like the video? The reason we ask you to like the video is, that's how YouTube algorithm works. The more you like the video, the more video will go to other students. If you want everyone to attend the biology, bio molecules class, please like the video so other students can also benefit from here. Okay, where is the remote? Amazing. Now, that is your biomolecules now let me tell you a simple definition of biomolecules right what is the simple difference what is the meaning of biomolecules we know bio means life right bio means living bio means living so the molecules right the molecules which are found in living cells the molecules which are found in the living cells are called your biomolecules yes the molecules Molecules found in living cells, found in living cells, yes, those are called as your biomolecules. Now students, these biomolecules are carbon based, yes, these biomolecules are carbon containing, they are carbon containing, yes, they are carbon containing. Now let me tell you a small story. Your NCRT also started with a small story. The small story is, this is your earth. This is your earth. Now this is your earth's crust. This is earth's crust. Now on this earth's crust, right, we find variety of elements. Yes, on this earth's crust, we have your carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. 
yes we have hydro we have carbon hydrogen oxygen now students the same elements can also be found in your living system yes the same elements can be found in your living systems then what is the difference between living and non living then who can tell me in the chat can i take some names md girij girija yes sanat crazy who can tell me in the chat what is the difference then between living and non living if the same elements are found in your earth crust the same elements are also found in your body what is the difference then what makes living apart from non living the answer is very simple the same elements students listen to me very carefully the same elements are found in abundance in the case of human body or animals the concentration or the abundance is more in the case of your human body that is the basic difference in the case of your elements which are found in the case of your living or the same elements which are found in your earth crust now i told you i told you your human body has carbon hydrogen oxygen but some of the students will be there in the chat tell me sir i don't believe you i do not believe that carbon hydrogen oxygen are found in your living cells then how do we who do you believe we don't have to believe anyone we have to believe in science so can we do a simple experiment to understand what are the components of living organisms can we do an experiments so students write down with me the experiment which is given in your ncert for the proof which will tell you that the components of your living body so the experiment starts very simple the experiment is very simple this experiment is called as chemical analysis chemical ana lysis in this chemical analysis and in this chemical analysis we take a living tissue like let's take a living tissue such as your um, a liver yes take one rat cut the rat open take the liver outside you have a rat liver you can take a rat ka liver here <laughs> do not do this i'm just telling you for experiment sake do not do this at home take a rat liver or if you do want to do it at home you can take a leaf simple all of us can take a leaf take a leaf now take this leaf or this liver now to this liver or leaf add it to a motor and pestle yes add it to a motor and pestle this is your motor all of you know in the house it might be there to make chutney you make right motor and pestle this is your motor and this is your pestle right motor and pestle now to this motor and pestle motor and pestle are yaar one second students motor and pestle now take this liver add this liver or leaf into the motor and pestle add it to your motor and pestle now apart from this leaf apart from this leaf we need a solvent we need a solvent called as tri right on with me we need a solvent called as trichloroacetic acid trichloro acetic acid now when you make chutney you add water to it right when you make chutney at home your mother makes chutney at home you add water to it similarly to make the chutney here we are adding a liver piece or we are adding a leaf and we are adding a solvent called as trichloroacetic acid you add that into this motor and pestle now nicely grind it nicely grind it properly now done imagine imagine in front of you you have a motor and pestle you are nicely grinding it now okay nicely grinding done now after nicely grinding it you get a slurry you get a nice slurry now take the slurry okay take this chutney or slurry some slimy slimy thing will be there now take this slurry add it into a beaker add it into a beaker now listen to me very carefully now this is where things get interesting let me students let me erase this here i need more space to write mm-hmm. one second we'll write it here this was your you got your motor and you have your pestle and you got your slurry now you add the slurry into a beaker on top of the beaker you need to keep a type of muslin cloth also called as cheese cloth yes on top of this you add a cloth like you know uh, you have a mesh 
that you pebble like you have seen in uh, cement uh, whenever they are purifying no cement uh, they have this mesh kind of thing where they add sand on top of it all fine sand will come outside all the rocks will be left on top just like that you have a mesh here you have a mesh here also called as muslin cloth or cheese cloth now you take this slurry and add on top of it yes we are adding the slurry on top of it now when we add the slurry the fine like just like the sand the fine particles will come down yes the fine part particles will come down and the bigger particles the thick stones or the bigger bigger particles will be left on the top the bigger particles will be left on the top now in science in science we call the lower part right which was soluble in your acid trichloroacetic acid this fraction the lower fraction is called as acid soluble acid soluble fraction acid soluble fraction what and all compounds were able to completely solubilize in your solvent with solvent trichloroacetic acid will come down called as acid soluble fraction now this acid soluble fraction is also called as your filtrate also called as what filtrate yes it's called as filtrate now students you tell me use common sense which particles will come down you tell me in the chat which particles will come down will it be large big big molecules or will it be small small kutti kutti small small molecules obviously the small ones will come down right the small ones will come down so the students here the molecules which will go down the mesh are usually less than 1000 daltons the molecules here are what less than 1000 daltons less than 1000 daltons less than 1000 daltons now students if the size of a molecule is less than 1000 daltons it is called as a micro molecule it is called as what it is called as a micro molecule micro molecule yes it is called as a micro molecule now what about the above fraction the molecules which are present on top the molecule completely or partially not soluble in the acid whatever acid which you use here right trichloroacetic acid the comp the molecules which are left on the top were not soluble at all they were not soluble they are like no i am not going to get soluble so these are called as what acid insoluble acid insoluble fraction acid insoluble fraction because they are not soluble in the acid now here we call it filtrate this is called as retentate it's called as what retentate one second students it's called as what retentate it's called as what retentate now here i told you the small small fine fine molecules came down the mesh yes their size was less than 1000 daltons but but the molecules which stayed on the top right which stayed on the top are uh, their size is actually more than 1000 daltons the size here is what more than 1000 daltons and these molecules whose size is more than 1000 daltons are called as your macro molecules they are called as what macro molecules called as what macro molecules let me summarize the entire experiment one more time here we did an experiment where we did a we took a liver piece and a, or a leaf piece just for safety sake to this leaf piece or liver fee, uh, liver piece we added acid that is a solvent that was your trichloroacetic acid yes we added a solvent now to this solvent when we added we put it into a mortar and pestle yes and to the, in this mortar and pestle we nicely made a chutney out of it like a slurry when we made the chutney we took the slurry and we added it on top of a muslin cloth or a cheese cloth and when we add on top of a cheese cloth right all the acid soluble came down called as your filtrate so whichever came down is called as your less than 1000 daltons they are called as acid soluble fraction 
they are called as filtrate and also called as your micro molecules yes and the substances the molecules which are on the top are called as your macro molecules because their size is more than 1000 daltons and they are called as retentate they are part of the retentate and they are also called as what acid insoluble fraction because the biomolecules on top the biomolecules on top of the mesh they did not dissolve they are like no i will not be dissolved by this acid so they are called as acid insoluble fraction now let me tell you some examples let me tell you some examples now let's say here only it is there see what are biomolecules carbon containing compounds which form the basic chemical structure of all the living so biomolecules are molecules which are found in the living cells they can be micromolecules or macromolecules what are micro there is less size low molecular weight that is 18 to 800 daltons alone they are not more than that they are not more than that because they are less than 1000 daltons then we have found in your acid soluble pool yes macro macro are found where macro are found in your acid soluble pool example is your simple sugars the first example of your micro molecule is a simple sugar like your monosaccharides like your monosaccharides then we have amino acids we also have nucleotides we also have what nucleotides then students come here listen to me this very carefully macro molecules are large sized they have high molecular weight what is the meaning of high molecular weight their size is more than 1000 daltons dalton yes they are found in the acid insoluble pool yes macro molecules were found where macro molecules were found in the acid insoluble because macro molecules were like no i will not dissolve today i will not dissolve today okay then we have what examples is your complex carbohydrates yes like your disaccharides oligosaccharides as well as your polysaccharides then we have your proteins then we have nucleic acids these are macro molecules now someone was telling in the chat here lipid here this can you see this one kalla here one uh, cheater lipid here is very special lipid here is very very special why because this lipid right here is a cheater why because the size of the lipid the size of the lipid is actually less than 1000 daltons yes your lipid size is less than 1000 daltons but in that case sir lipid should be in the filtrate then right why have we mentioned lipid in the macro molecules because students this lipids are like a big fat gang they are one rowdy gang there right they are very big gang they'll form a big gang all the lipids will join hands and they form something called as vesicles they have formed something called as vesicles and when they form a big gang they will not go down the cheese cloth and they will not filter out to the acid soluble in fact lipid even though the size is less even though the size is less they will be in your macro molecule also in your acid insoluble fraction also in your retentate so they'll be in where they'll be in the retentate so your lipids will be where lipids will be in even though size is less even though their size is less than 1000 daltons lipids will be in retentate they are considered as macro molecules they are acid insoluble fraction lipids will be in acid insoluble fraction till here is everything clear to all of you lipids are micro molecules but they are not strictly macro molecules that is the line of ncert your ncert clearly says that lipids are not strictly macro molecules understood till now any doubt till now you can ask me i'm looking at the chat right now md is asking sir what about lipids lipids topic is done yes any doubt till now you can ask me this is your doubt time any doubt you can ask me right now i'll clear live on live i'll clear the doubt if you do not have any doubt here i will go to the next concept clear all of you clear is the light less today is the light less on the face i think the light have decreased the light on the camera should i increase the light should i increase the brightness a little if you are able to see the board clearly that is more important 
if you're able to see the board clearly that is more important no doubt amazing rupa amazing charm now see here students in this chapter in this biomolecules chapter the tables are you know very important the tables are very very important the every single table here is equally important so throughout the chapter i'll be telling you many tables throughout the chapter i'll be telling you many tables all you need to do is understand the table if you have any doubt in the table you can ask me then and there okay now see the table here the table here is showing a comparison of elements present in your non living as well as living matter now i told you the difference between the elements here is the composition or the abundance if you look at here hydrogen is more in your human body carbon is more in your human body oxygen is more in the human body even nitrogen is more in the human body see that is the beauty of the first line i told you that is even though the same elements are found in your earth crust and also your living living uh, humans as well as you li living beings the main difference here is the abundance main difference here is the abundance and this table is the proof for it this table is the proof for it okay clear one second students let me call someone to increase the brightness one second tar tam pam Let me call someone. Uh, इतना थोड़ा brightness increase हो सकता है थोड़ा सा थोड़ा हाँ भाई बच्चे हिंदी में सुन रहे हैं तुमको little bit of more little bit more brightness I'm trying to but Someone is asking me. Uh, most of the hydrogen formed is water. Yes, most of them are in the hydrogen form. That's why the hydrogen concentration is less. But because most of the body has water as water, is it increased? I don't think so. It's increased. Someone is asking me, sir. Please mention the PYQs in this chapter. Yes, I have mentioned a lot of PYQs in this chapter. Okay. Now, I told. here we discussed the hydrogen carbon oxygen nitrogen now i'm telling you now i'm telling you in the human body we also have sulfur sodium calcium magnesium and silicon now again you should not believe me you should not believe me you should believe science again how what is the science here now i'll make sure i'll teach you another experiment one more experiment which will show you the proof that your human body also has the following in organic in organic components okay is the brightness increase now students is the brightness increase now okay can we do one more experiment can we do one more experiment here the second experiment experiment number 2 all the future scientists doctors everyone do the second experiment imagine you doing the experiment okay imagine you are doing the experiments do the experiment with me okay now again in the second experiment you take a leaf in the second experiment you take a fresh leaf fresh leaf in the second experiment you should take a fresh leaf yes we took a fresh leaf okay now what do you do you take this fresh leaf and you completely dry it out completely dry it keep it inside an oven not cooking oven there is something called a separate uh you know oven for for scientific reasons that oven you keep it or keep it in a shaded region okay now you take this leaf it's called as it's a fresh leaf the fresh leaf will have water yes the fresh leaf will have water inside it so weight here is called as wet weight the weight here is called as what wet weight yes it is called as wet weight because water is present here water is present here now what do we do this leaf completely dry it out yes completely dry it out it is evaporation of water 
Yes, evaporation is happening. That is minus H two O. Now we have one dry, sad looking leaf. Dry leaf. This is called as your dry weight. It will have a weight called as dry weight because all the water has been gone now. Now you take this leaf and completely grind it again. Completely grind it. Take a mortar. Take a pestle. Completely grind it now. Okay. Completely grind it. That is make the powder. Make the powder of it. Now, after making the powder, the next step is completely burn it out. Completely burn it. That is called as incineration. You need to completely burn this. Once you burn, right? Whenever there is burning, also called as combustion. In combustion, is there? Its combustion is also a type of oxidation. Yes, sir. There is oxidation is happening. Oxidation is happening. When we burn leaf, when you burn leaf, what do you obtain? When we completely burn the leaf, that is called as your ash. That is called as your ash. This is called as your ash weight. Not your Pokemon ash. This is the ash. That is I don't know what you call it in uh, charcoal. You know charcoal you get na charcoal. That is called as your ash. Now take this ash and you send it for analysis. Send it for. Analysis. When we send the ash for analysis, in the analysis we obtain, we see that with the help of the certain techniques like HPLC technique or there are many spectroscopy techniques and everything. When we do those such techniques, right, we obtain that we observe the ash, right? All the when we have the ash, right, all the organic compounds are gone. Yes, all the organic compounds are gone. We will obtain the inorganic compounds. And those inorganic compounds are nothing but those inorganic compounds are nothing but your calcium, sodium, sulfur, manganese, as well as silicon. That is your experiment number two. See here, you get your sodium, you get potassium, calcium, magnesium, water, as well as your salts, different different salts and phosphates. These are the list of representative inorganic constituents of the living tissue. Do not take my word. Do the experiment. You will get the following different elements if you do the experiment. So first experiment gave us the organic compounds. The second experiment gave us the inorganic compounds. Clear? Clear, everyone? Clear? Is that point clear to all of you? What is the use? Can we read the NCERT lines? Are the lines visible to all of you? Are the NCERT lines visible to all of you? Tell me in the chat right now. If not, I have to decrease the brightness. This is the problem. Are NCERT lines visible to all of you? Let me check in my phone only. All of you are scams. Yeah, it is visible. So, students, this is the starting part of the chapter. That is, element analysis performed. If we perform such analysis on plant tissue, animal tissue, or microbial paste, we obtain a list of elements like carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and several other the respective. Contained per unit mass of living tissue is the same analysis we performed in a piece of Earth's crust. I told you, the same elements will be found in your human body as well as the same elements will be found in the Earth's crust, right? As an example of non-living matter, we obtain the similar list. The same elements will be found in your living living on organisms, also the non-living organisms. What are the difference between the two lists then? In the absolute terms, no such difference could be made out. Yes, no such difference could be made out. But all the elements present in the sample of the Earth crust are also present in the sample of your living tissue. However, a closer examination reveals that the relative abundance, relative abundance, that is relative abundance of carbon, hydrogen, with respect to other elements, is higher in in the Living organisms than the Earth's crust. That is the first paragraph your NCERT, which we discussed completely. I hope none of you have any doubt here with respect to this particular paragraph. Okay. Now, second paragraph. We can continue asking the same way. What type of organic compounds are found in your living organisms? I told you. Do not believe me. Believe the science. Experiment time. 
how does how does one go on to finding the answer that is to get an answer one has to perform a chemical analysis all of you did the analysis i did the analysis with you we can take a living tissue a vegetable or a piece of liver the poor rat the poor rat we cut open right that is a rat here and grind it and with a trichloro acetic acid that was the acid which we used formula is important students write down the formula that is cl3 cl3 cc oh using a motor and pestle we obtain a thick slurry chutney we obtain na if we were to strain this through the cheese cloth or a muslin cloth we would obtain two fractions one is called as what one is called as your filtrate or more technically acid soluble pool yes the down one is called as what acid soluble pool also called as your filtrate which has what molecules less than 1000 daltons yes the second one is the retentate or the acid insoluble fraction the above one acid insoluble scientists have found thousands of organic compounds in the acid soluble pool so in the acid soluble pool which in the below we have more number of organic compounds okay in higher class you will learn about the how to analyze living tissues which you will learn later on okay what is important here we finished everything here right mm, compounds of organic in other words one isolates purifies compounds analytical techniques this is not this we is same now sure living organisms have also got inorganic elements the experiment number second yes experiment number second a compounds in them how do we know this what is the how do we know that do not believe me believe the science again a slightly different but destructive experiment why is it destructive because we are completely burning the specimen here right one has to be done one weighs a small amount of living tissue say a leaf or liver that is called as wet waste yes i drew it with me and completely dry it later on all the water evaporates yes i told you minus h2o all the water is completely evaporating the remaining material gives dry weight now we have the dry weight from wet weight to dry weight now if the tissue is fully burnt completely burn it incineration all the carbon compounds all the organic compounds are oxidized i wrote down the word oxidation to gaseous form that is co2 as well as water vapor everything is gone and are removed what is remain is called as the ash what is remain is the ash is left out now the same ash this ash contains the inorganic elements like your calcium magnesium etc the inorganic compounds like your sulfate phosphate are also seen in the acid soluble fraction remember your phosphate as well as your sulfate are found in your acid soluble they are also the inorganic compounds which are found in the destructive method okay therefore elements analysis gives us the elemental composition of the living tissue it is in the form of hydrogen oxygen chlorine carbon everything this is the table here students i am covering the every line of ncr today so all of you can understand with me if you do not want me to teach you every line of ncrt i'll be like okay fine i will uh, teach you the entire chapter on my own we will skip the ncrt let me in the chat how do we do it let me know in the chat right now how do you want it do you want me to read every line of ncrt like this and explain you every line here or do you want me to just teach the normal condition in normal way let me know right now because i thought i'll teach you with help of ncrt and both everything i thought i'll teach you ncrt lines i thought i'll make sure you understand every line of ncrt along with the concept teach every line so when we do ncrt right when we do every line of ncrt also you get that confidence sir that i know every line of ncrt in this chapter i know everything okay so that is the reason we have decided on this channel to make sure you learn every line of ncrt along with the concept okay every line of ncrt along with that will be teaching you the concept also okay now tell me in the chat what is anyone knows what is an amino acid you might have heard about it we have might have understood sir amino acid makes up the protein right yes that is correct 
Amino acid is the building block of your protein synthesis. But what is an amino acid? Amino acid is actually a type of your monomer. Amino acid is a type of monomer. It is a monomer. When we have multiple amino acids, when we have multiple amino acids, multiple monomers, they join together and they form the protein. They form the protein. Now you tell me in the chat, amino acid, will it come under acid soluble or acid insoluble? Tell me quickly. The answer is very simple. That is, your, your amino acids are very tiny. They are the micromolecules. Their size is less than 1000 Daltons. So the, you will find them in acid soluble fraction. Okay, you'll find them in acid soluble fraction. Acid soluble fraction or pool. Or pool. Okay, acid soluble or, or in, the, in the filtrate. So amino acid plus amino acid plus amino acid will give you the proteins. So chain of amino acids gives you the protein. Now students, you know, there are so many types of proteins. Yes, sir. There is your creatine, collagen, rhodopherin. Then we have melanin, trypsin, actin. Then we have your hemoglobin, glucagon, pepsin. So many different types of proteins. To make so many types of proteins, that is millions of protein, how many amino acids can we have? You might be thinking, so there are 50 amino acids, there may be, so to make millions, at least we should have 100 amino acids. We should have 200 amino acids. But the answer is not that much. The answer is very simple. We just have 20 amino acids. We just have 20 amino acids to make up the millions and millions of proteins. Just 20 amino acids. And out of this 20 amino acids, right, where do we get it from? Right, where do we obtain amino acids? Can crazy go crazy dude go to the shop and tell, sir, Anna, I, I give me one kg amino acid. Can he give you? If Sanat, Sanat goes or Shivani goes, take Shivani. Shivani is going to your uh, shop. He's tell, uh, she's telling you, Anna, I want uh, one liter of amino acids. Can you get that? No. So then where do we get amino acids from? Amino acids are obtained from your general food, that is diet. Your amino acids are taken up with the help of the general diet. That is your fish. Fish has a lot of protein we say. We have green grams. Green grams have a lot of protein. Yes. Then we have your different pulses. Different pulses have so much of protein. So all the amino acids, all the amino acids which we obtain from the surrounding food which we eat. Okay. Now if you want to classify the amino acids, if you classify generally, amino acids can be divided into essential amino acids as well as non-essential amino acids. Okay. Essential as well as non-essential. Now, what is the meaning of essential? Essential amino acids are the amino acids which are required by the body, but they are not produced in the body. Simple. Essential amino acids are the amino acids which body does not provide them. Body does not produce. Body does not produce this. That is, they are obtained. How do we obtain them? They are obtained from food. They are obtained from food. Now, what is non-essential amino acids? Non-essential amino acids are the amino acids which are produced by the body. Non-essential are what? They are produced by the body. By the body. That's why they are called as non-essential. Now, students, will this come in examination? Yes, it will come in examination. But students, will they ask you what is non-essential, what is essential? No. But what will they ask, sir? How, what kind of questions can we expect here? That is the question, right? The answer is, they will ask you the examples here. Yes. Here, can you see? The examples for your essential amino acids is your entire big list here. Phenyl, enlin, valine, theonine, tryptophan, isoleucine, methionine. If I keep telling, it's like I'm telling that, uh, you know, 
when you go to your shop, uh, hotel, little masal dosa, masal dosa, idli vada sambar like that. I'm telling you, that's many essential and non-essential amino acids are there. This is what they'll ask you in the examination. Right? This is what they'll ask you in the examination. Now, one thing is there, sir. Is there a trick to remember this? Students, do you want a trick to remember the essential and non-essential amino acids? Because there was a question probably in your 2016. How many of them are essential amino acids? How many of them are non-essential amino acids? How will you remember? So I have a small trick for you. You can make your own trick, but I have a small trick for you. I will give you a small trick here, okay? Now, the trick here is very simple. That is, for essential amino acids, the small trick is what? The small trick is private, that is your private, like you know, you have that private as a rank. Private Tim Hall. The P in the private stands for phenylalanine, V is valine, T is threonine. Then we have Tim, that is tryptophan, isoleucine, and methionine. Then we have Hall, histidine, arginine, lysine, and leucine. Students, I'll tell you one small important point here that is even though you might have an amazing trick you might have an amazing trick but 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 if you don't practice the trick if you don't practice the trick in the exam hall the trick will become very tricky to all of you you might not even remember the trick so you might think an exam Sir, I have an example for, I have a trick for you, essential amino acid. In the exam hall, I'll go and I'll write, write around say. It won't happen. You have to actually practice the trick also. You have to practice the trick also. Similarly, for your non-essential amino acids, there's a small trick. What is the trick here? Almost all guys get cut after going to play sports. That is, A is aspartic acid, A is alanine here, G is glycine, other second G is glutamic acid, they are C, cysteine, aspergine, glutamate, tyrosine, proline and serine. Now I'll tell you one more thing. If you don't practice your trick right, what will happen? I'll tell you, this is a reality. Basic reality it is, I'll tell you. Every one of you will face it because even I faced it. Learn from my mistake because I never practice my tricks. I used to think in the exam hall, I will go. I know an amazing trick. I will go and write the trick only. But when you go to the exam, what happens? I'll tell you. When you go to the exam hall, this T will become not tyrosine. This T will become your tryptophan. You will be like, okay, all more, almost all guys get cut after going to play. Two will become, instead of tyrosine, you will write tryptophan. That will happen. I am very sure it will happen. So that is why I am telling you, whatever trick you might have, please practice your trick, okay? For I am telling you this 100 times because it has happened to me. It has happened to me. I went to the exam hall. I'm thinking, I know a trick, okay? Because I used to make tricks for everything. I'm like, okay, fine. A, B. I used to have like H, A, C, B. H, A, C, B is the example. Then I'll go to the exam. I don't even know what is H. Then I know C. Then I don't know what is G. So if you don't practice your trick right, you are bound to go wrong. Okay, you are bound to go wrong. Okay, that is a trick. Now, let's understand the structure of amino acid now. Let's understand structure. Listen to me very carefully now. Structure, okay? Every single amino acid is actually a substituted methane. What is the meaning of that, sir? First write down, then I'll tell you the meaning of it. Every single amino acid are substituted. They're what? Substituted methane. Now, what is methane? Methane is nothing but your CH4. Yes, methane is CH4. Now, you need to start substituting. This is your methane now. One, one hydrogen, second hydrogen, third hydrogen, four hydrogen. Now start substituting now. Instead of this particular hydrogen, we will add a carboxyl group here. C O O H. Yes, carboxyl group. Instead of this hydrogen here, we will add a amino group that is N H2. This is your amino group. This is your carboxylic group. This hydrogen, you keep it as same. Now, instead of this hydrogen, you add a R here. Now, what is this R? R is nothing but a functional group here. R is nothing but a, R is nothing but a, a functional group. 
functional group r is nothing but a functional group now students listen to me very carefully this is a very basic difference here based on the functional group based on the functional group every single amino acid is changed this basic skeleton will be remaining same every single amino acid will have your carboxylic group amino group and hydrogen but this r this functional group this functional group will keep on changing for every single amino acid clear for every single amino acid this functional group will change but carboxylic acid amino group and hydrogen will remain same write down in your book right now write down in your book right now the structure of your amino acid once you write down just type done sir i wrote down the fun i wrote down the structure of your amino acid learn with me right now don't don't sit later on and you know uh, after making the notes keep making the notes later on right right now make the notes with me okay what i tell you carbon hydrogen a carboxylic group yes a what is a carboxylic group other one is your amine group your amino group that is nh2 nh2 group now write down with me one by one well, listen to me very carefully now here we have r group if if this r group is a nothing but a simple a simple hydrogen if this r group right here is a hydrogen we get the amino acid called as your glycine we get the amino acid glycine amino acid done now let me tell you a few points about your glycine let me tell you a few points about your glycine this glycine is actually the most simplest the most simplest amino acid it is the most simplest amino acid okay done sir now tell me in the chat what is a chiral carbon anyone in the chat who can tell me what is a chiral carbon if you know the basic chemistry you can tell me sir chiral carbon is a carbon which has four different atoms four different surroundings for example here we have your hydrogen carbon nitrogen and hydrogen again is this a chiral carbon no sir this is not a chiral carbon because on all four sides we do not have different types of atoms yes here we have hydrogen again hydrogen so can i tell this is non chiral yes it is non chiral in nature non chiral in nature yes it is non chiral in nature now since this is non chiral in nature the glycine amino acid is optically inactive optically inactive it is optically in active now if i have to teach you what is the meaning of optically inactive what is the meaning of chiral carbon what is your alpha carbon that you will be you will be learning in your biomolecules chemistry counterpart okay you will be learning that in chemistry okay you will be learning that in chemistry and this is the only only amino acid which is what which is non chiral in nature non chiral in nature only amino acid the only amino acid which is non chiral in nature because it has a hydrogen here for the functional group now this r is hydrogen here now this r i'll replace it with methane group all of us know what is methane methane is nothing but your ch3 group yes methane is ch3 group so we have a ch3 here once you add ch3 here it becomes your alanine it becomes what alanine write down the structure right now in your book if you write the structure here in your book you write it like this carbon carboxy group amino group hydrogen here and here i'm writing your ch3 group ch3 group write down like this right now and tell me in the chat yes sir i wrote down the structure of your alanine write down the structure of alanine 
स्टूडेंट्स दे विल आस्क यू दे विल आस्क यू द स्ट्रक्चर आई एम रिपीटिंग दिस चैप्टर फ्रॉम दिस चैप्टर द क्वेश्चन आर गोन बी योर स्ट्रक्चर और द क्वेश्चन आर गोन बी स्टेटमेंट बेस्ड क्वेश्चन ओके दिस इज योर एलन इन नाउ यू टेल मीन अ चैट इज दिस एलन इन स्ट्रक्चर इज इट काइरल कार्बन और इज इट नॉन काइरल इन नेचर ऑल ऑफ अस नो दिस इज योर अल्फा कार्बन अल्फा कार्बन हैज वॉट वन फंक्शन ग्रुप हियर सेकेंड थर्ड फोर्थ ऑल फोर ऑफ द आइटम्स आर कंप्लीटली डिफरेंट दिस इज कॉल्ड एज काइरल इन नेचर इट इज कॉल्ड इट इज काइरल इन नेचर ओके दिस इज काइरल इन नेचर नाउ नेक्स्ट वन इन स्ट ऑफ इन द आर ग्रुप नाउ इन द आर ग्रुप वी विल सब्सिट्यूट वी विल सब्सिट्यूट हाइड्रोक्सी मिथाइल वॉट इज हाइड्रोक्सी मिथाइल हाइड्रोक्सी मिथाइल इज योर सी एच टू ओ एच यस हाइड्रोक्सी मिथाइल इज सी एच टू ओ एच नाउ रिप्लेस द आर नाउ अगेन रिप्लेस द आर विथ सी एच टू ओ एच सी एच टू ओ एच दिस इज सेम दट इज सी ओ एच एच एन एच टू ओ एच द आर ग्रुप इज नाउ वॉट हाइड्रोक्सी मिथाइल दट इज सी एच टू ओ एच वी गेट द अमाइनो एसिड सीरीन वी गेट द अमाइनो एसिड सीरीन फर्स्ट वी हैड ग्लाइसिन सिंगल हेच देन वी हैड योर अलिन विच हैज अ मिथाइल ग्रुप देन वी हैव योर सी एच टू ओ एच दट इज नथिंग बट योर सीरीन दट इज नथिंग बट योर सीरीन दो सर द्री एग्जाम्पल्स विच यू नीड टू राइट डाउन एंड टाइप मी इन द चैट डन सर आई रोट डाउन द एग्जाम्पल डन एंड डस्टेड नाउ देर आर सर्टन अमाइनो एसिड्स विच कैन कंटेन सल्फर देर आर सर्टन अमाइनो एसिड्स विच कैन हैव सल्फर इन दैन दिस स्ट्रक्चर इज नॉट इंपॉर्टेंट बट यू नीड टू नो द एग्जाम्पल द एग्जाम्पल फॉर योर सल्फर कंटेनिंग अमाइनो एसिड इज मिथ्योन एज वेल एज सिस्टीन मिथ्योन एज वेल एज सिस्टीन आर सल्फर कंटेनिंग अमाइनो एसिड नाउ यू कैन टेल मी इन द चैट Have you heard methionine anywhere? Anywhere you have heard methionine? Which chapter? In your molecular base of inheritance, when you were learning about your molecular base of inheritance, when you were learning about your start codon, 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 when you were okay all of you i don't want all of you to sit back again later on keep biomolecules as a backlog this chapter is going to be very long and at the end of today's at the end of today's session i want each and every one of you to be like biomolecules done and dusted that is my goal today okay now the next one is your classification of amino acids based on presence of aromatic ring yes based on your aromatic ring if there is aromatic ring is nothing but your benzene ring here benzene ring so based on the amino acid of the aromaticness it is divided into two types it is divided into two types the first one is called as aromatic amino acid called as what aromatic amino acid the the second type is called as what non aromatic non aromatic amino acid non am uh, aromatic there's a the other name for this the other name for non aromatic is called as aliphatic it's also called as what aliphatic also called as what aliphatic amino acids now what is aromatic amino acid aromatic amino acids are amino acids with a benzene ring they have a benzene ring see here one here one here one here they have a benzene ring now what about your non aromatic amino acids non non aromatic amino acids are linear amino acids linear amino acids they are what linear chain of amino acids one long straight chain of amino acids are aliphatic or non aromatic amino acids now what is important here will they ask you what is non aromatic amino acid you need examination the answer is no they will not ask you what is aromatic or non aromatic what will they ask you then they will ask you the examples 
they will ask you the examples for your non aromatic as well as aromatic amino acids so in your syllabus there are three aromatic amino acids what are three the three aromatic amino acids are nothing but your phenyl alanine tryptophan as well as tyrosine as well as what tyrosine these are the three different examples of your aromatic amino acids do you need to learn the structure structure no no you do not have to learn the structure structure you have learned but do you need to remember the examples yes you need to remember the examples now do i have a trick here the answer is no but can i teach you to help the remember the examples the answer is yes how will i help you to remember the examples by interconnecting the chapters when i interconnect the chapters you will be able to understand and remember the examples how will i do it listen to me now listen to me now right now in your how many of you know the uh, disease called as pku disease how many of you know what is pku disease p k u disease phenyl ketonuria disease it is a autosomal recessive disease yes it is autosomal recessive disease which chapter you learn in i think principles of inheritance right in principles of inheritance you learned about a autosomal recessive disease now this autosomal recessive disease is because of a mutation in a gene that gene is responsible for a enzyme called as your phenyl alanine hydrolase enzyme if that hydrolase enzyme is not produced if the gene is inactive what will happen phenyl alanine will increase in concentration that will cause a disease called as pku disease so can you remember the example now the remember example for your aromatic amino acid is your phenyl alanine how do you remember it by the help of disease called as pku disease clear that's how you remember okay you interconnect the chapters can also remember the examples okay now what about tryptophan which chapter you study if you if you have learned tryptophan is actually a precursor tryptophan is a precursor in your melatonin and serotonin melatonin it is a precursor in your melatonin and serotonin melatonin and serotonin melatonin and serotonin and also if you have if you have also if you have also uh, understood the chapter plant growth and development there i told you there i told you tryptophan is a precursor tryptophan is a precursor of your auxin it is a precursor for your auxin synthesis yes it is involved in the auxin synthesis yes that is also correct sir that's how you can remember the tryptophan now what about tyrosine tyrosine where have you heard the tyrosine tyrosine is actually involved in your emergency hormone the emergency hormone such as your um, adrenaline epinephrine in the preparation of epinephrine and adrenaline tyrosine is involved and also in the preparation of your thyroid hormone in the preparation of your thyroid hormone thyroxine tyrosine is involved yes tyrosine is involved there also and also this is a precursor for your melanin also precursor for your melanin see i am revising the other chapters also because that is also important okay don't be like sir why are you teaching zoology now that is also very important okay so there are three different examples for your aromatic amino acid first one is your phenyl alanine then we have your tryptophan then we also have your tyrosine then we also have your tyrosine those are the three examples for your aromatic amino acids will you remember them will you remember them just say yes sir i'll remember it i can remember the examples as such i don't need to know all this extra information but you will study the extra information in those chapters also i am just helping you to connect the chapters because students this is a chapter this is a gateway chapter which will help you to understand other chapters such as your human physiology plant physiology molecular base of inheritance sexual reproduction of flowering plants every single chapter has a component of the this chapter here that is 
biomolecules that is the importance of this chapter and also do you know when you go to your mbbs first year mbbs first year when you go you will have a complete unit called as biochemistry complete unit called as biochemistry that time you will remember every single thing you study right now will be studied in detail later on yes you will be studying in detail later on again that time so listen to this chapter very carefully i want every student of mine today to understand this chapter so that it will be useful to you even in your mbbs first year okay clear so with that confidence i want to see some green hearts in the chat like the video also if you have understood all the points till now okay now based on the number of amino acids and carboxylic groups based on your amino group number of amino group as well as based on your carboxylic group amino acids can again be classified into your acidic amino acid acidic amino acid basic amino acid as well as neutral amino acid now what is the meaning of acidic amino acid if you look at the structure look at the structure and understand don't by heart look at the structure of your acidic amino acid with the help of examples i've given here with the help of examples we have two examples here one is your aspartic acid yes aspartic acid other one is your glutamic acid if you look at the structures of your glutamic acid as well as aspartic acid you will find an extra carboxylic group yes cooh group extra carboxylic group so what are your acidic amino acid acidic amino acids are the amino acids which have an extra side chain the side chain here is what in the side chain we have a extra carboxylic group extra carboxylic group so in total if you look at the structure this is your cooh this is your nh2 the basic which we learned before which we learned before one cooh group one is nh2 group one is your carbon this is your hydrogen here you can write this is your r group if you look at the r group here it has an extra carboxylic group again if you look at the example of your aspartic acid again carboxylic amino group but we have an extra carboxylic group that is why they are called as what that's why they are called as your acidic amino acids because they have two carboxylic groups one two carboxylic groups two carboxylic groups and only one amino group only one amino group two carboxylic groups clear that is why they are called as acidic amino acids now what about basic amino acid sir what about basic amino acid look at the structure again what does the structure say if you look at the three examples here is lysine arginine and histidine yes lysine arginine and histidine if you look at the structure here you will find an extra nh2 group extra nh2 group extra nh group that is why they are called as basic amino acid that is if you write down the definition of your basic amino acid basic amino acid in the side chain in the side chain it will have what extra amine group extra amine group now you tell me in the chat where have you heard lysine and arginine and histidine in the chapter which is chapter molecular base of inheritance molecular base of inheritance when you learn about your dna coiling around the histone protein don't we learn there we don't we learn there the two basic amino acid that is your lysine as well as arginine yes we learn there also so examples for your basic amino acid is lysine arginine as well as histidine lysine arginine as well as histidine what about acidic acidic is your aspartic acid as well as glutamic acid now i want everyone to write down these examples once you write down these examples just tell yes sir i wrote on the examples i am learning with you today completely okay now what about basic amino acid basic amino acid is basic what basic amino acid is very basic that is it has only one coh one nh2 
and rest everything is neutral rest everything is neutral here example is glycine in your ncrt they have given the example of valine here you can also write glycine also as a neutral amino acid okay now i'll tell you the total amino acids calculate once again the total amino acids are how many the total amino acids are total amino acids are in total 20 amino acids yes we have 20 amino acids in the 20 amino acids we have two are your acidic three are basic three are basic and rest 15 are rest 15 are what neutral in nature 15 are what neutral in nature so we learned about classification of your amino acids based on the COH group as well as based on the NH2 group done and dusted hopefully you are following till now hopefully you are following till now the next I'll teach you one of the most important question or a concept that is Zwitter ion concept okay listen to me very carefully now I want all of your 100% attention can you give me 100% attention now yes sir you can give me 100% attention because you don't have anywhere to go now okay you're trapped here what is that so your amino acids right your amino acids will be in different state based on the pH at different pH at different pH different states of amino acids will be there a same amino acid will be formed in a different state on a particular pH didn't understand let me tell you with the help of an example okay let me tell you the help of an example write an example with me for example take a simple amino acid take a simple amino acid you have your carbon we have your COH here COH we have your NH2 here then we have your uh, what is that hydrogen then we have your R group here right R group now you take this amino acid and you add it in a acidic medium you add it in a acidic medium in acidic medium there are H plus yes acidic medium there are H plus now this H plus this H plus will go and attack here this H, H in acidic medium where pH is low this H plus will attack this particular NH2 and this will get converted to what COOH R group this will be your H group this will become NH3 this will become what NH3 and this is your basic it will become a basic amino acid it become what basic amino acid so amino acid kept in acidic medium and an amino acid kept in acidic medium will become basic in nature will become what basic in nature similarly similarly you take an take an amino acid again take an amino acid take an amino acid that is your NH3 that is R group now keep this amino acid keep this amino acid in a basic medium in a basic medium when we keep the amino acid in a basic medium what happens the proton is not added the proton is lost here the proton is what the proton is lost this H plus this H plus this H plus is lost to the medium so what do we get we get a amino acid which looks like this we get amino acid which looks like this this is your plus here so and this amino acid is acidic in nature it is acidic in nature it's an acidic amino acid so students what is the conclusion here the conclusion here is a particular amino acid will change its phase it will completely change itself depending upon the pH it's in kept in if you go back to the previous slide if you go to previous slide here we have an amino acid which is kept in your low pH when it is kept in low pH can you see it becoming NH3 plus yes in low pH that is in acidic medium when you keep the amino acid in acidic medium 
in acidic medium that is low pH the it becomes NH3 plus and it is become a it becomes a cation it becomes a cation similarly if you take the amino acid if you take amino acid and keep it in very high pH that is in basic medium it becomes acidic in nature that is a it becomes a anion it becomes a anion now listen to me very carefully listen to me very very carefully there is a condition there is a condition where there is a condition where you have your carbon we have your hydrogen here we have your nh2 we have cooh and we have your r group here at one particular ph at one particular ph this hydrogen will join here this is called as what this is called as your intramolecular proton transfer at a particular ph at a particular ph what happens intramolecular intra molecular proton transfer intramolecular proton transfer is happening what will happen this when this proton is transferred here this will become what this will become co minus yes when the proton is transferred this becomes co minus and this becomes nh3 plus intramolecular proton transfer when the intramolecular proton transfer is happening we get a ion we don't get cation we don't get anion we get an ion called as amphoteric ion this amphoteric ion is also called as your zwitter ion it is also called as your zwitter ion so zwitter ion is a type of your amphoteric ion which as a result of your intramolecular proton transfer this is a a molecule with one functional group having positive charge on one side and other functional group having a negative charge so the same the same the same your zwitter ion is a ion which has your positive side as well as a negative side look here zwitter ion negative side as well as your positive side and this negative side and positive side will completely cancel each other out so what is the net charge here the net charge here is shunya also called as your zero complete zero net charge see here have positive charge as well as negative charge the net charge is completely zero here and that i told you this is where your formation takes place at a particular ph yes at a particular ph that ph is called as what isoelectric ph that ph is called as what isoelectric ph at particular ph i told you that ph is called as what isoelectric ph you will be learning the same concept in your chemistry but i am teaching in biology also because zwitter ion zwitter ion is a previous year neat question from biology it is a previous year neat question from biology okay all of us know what is zwitter ion zwitter ion is a amphoteric ion which has one positive functional group one negative functional group the net charge is completely zero and it is formed at a particular ph that ph is called as what isoelectric ph that is at a particular ph intramolecular proton transfer is happening that is the proton from here is transferred to your nh2 group here clear is everyone clear with the concept here this is biochemistry bio and chemistry both are there okay clear that is your zwitter ion can we read the lines of ncert can we read the lines of ncert now can we read the ncert line and revise once again yes sir we can amino acids are organic compounds yes they are organic compounds containing an amino group and an acidic group as a substituents of the same carbon that is the alpha carbon hence they are called as alpha amino of alpha amino acid the reason they are called as alpha amino acids is because there is alpha carbon is present okay they are see they are 
substituated methanes. I wrote down substituated methanes. Every line of NCRT, there are four substituted groups occupying the four vacancy positions. These are a hydro, one is a hydrogen, other one is your carboxyl group, other one is your amino group and a variable group. The variable group is called as your R group or called as your R group. Clear? Now, based on the nature of R group, there are many amino acids. How many? 20 amino acids. Right? There are only 20 amino acids. Right? There are 20 amino acids. The R group is proteinaceous amino acid could be your hydrogen. If it is only hydrogen, it is called as your glycine. I wrote down, we wrote down this glycine. If it is a methyl group, it is called as alanine. If it is a hydroxymethyl, it is called as serine. Every single structure wrote down by all of you in your notebook. Done. Now, three of the 20 are shown in the figure 9.1, which I'll show you soon enough. I'll show you. The chemical and physical properties of amino acids are essentially of the amino carboxyl and, and the R functional group. Based on the number of amino and carboxyl group, there are acidic amino acids. I told you, if there are more carboxyl group, if there are more carboxyl group, it is called as acidic amino acid. Yes. Example is glutamic acid as well as aspartic acid. Now, what is basic amino acid? I told you, basic amino acid is the amino acid which has more number of NH2 group, more number of amino group. What were the examples? Lysine, arginine and histidine. Lysine is only given here. Then we have neutral amino acids. The example which I gave you are glycine. They have given an example of valine here. Similarly, there are aromatic amino acids. We discussed that also. What are the amino acids? Tyrosine, phenylalanine and tryptophan. I gave you, remember, methods to remember it also. Yes, done. A particular property of amino acid is ionizable nature. What is ionizable nature? That is, an amino acid can change its state depending upon the pH. That is, ionizable nature of your NH2 and CO group. Hence, in a solution of different pH, in a solution of different pH, the structure of amino acid changes. Did I tell you that? Yes, sir. I told you that an amino acid can change its st structure depending upon a pH. And at a particular pH, we have what? At a particular pH, we have intramolecular proton transfer. That proton is called as, that particular ion is called as zwitter ion. That is called as what? Zwitter ion. Where net charge is zero and it is found at a pH called as isoelectric pH. Here. Done. <clears throat> Can you solve the question now? Can you solve the question? The question is, an amino acid having a property of ionizable nature. An amino acid has a property of ionizable nature of NH2, COH group, hence having different structures of different pH. Yes, amino acids can exist. Amino acid can exist at different pH depending upon, can different structures at different pH. Second statement is here what? Second statement is, amino acids can exit as zwitter ion form at acid and basic pH. Now you tell me in the chat, which of the following statements are correct? Is it statement number one, or is it statement number two, or both the statements are correct? I'll give you 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one both statement one and statement two are absolutely correct yes zwitter ion is found where acidic and basic ph both are there amino acids have a property where uh, amino acid can exist in different structure depending upon the ph amazing see students the reason i'm teaching you zwitter ion because i have gone through last 10 year pyqs Last 10 year PYQ, PYQs have gone through. My teaching style is entirely based on your exam orientation. What you require for your examination, I'll be teaching you. Nothing out of it. Okay? Here and there, I'll give you extra information. That is for your own benefit. Okay? 
Next question. Identify the basic amino acid from the following. This is again a neat PYQ. These are not easy questions. These are not random questions. These are not random questions. These are neat previous questions. Now I'll give you 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Time's up. Time's up. This is lysine. This is your lysine. Clear? Lysine is the answer here. <clears throat> Valine is your neutral. Tyrosine is your uh, aromatic. Glutamic acid is your acidic amino acid. Now students, if they ask you in examination NEET 2024, which of the following are your acidic amino acid? You should tell me in the chat. Yes, you should tell me in the chat which is the acidic amino acid. You will be able to answer. In the examination, they can ask you which of the following are aromatic amino acid. You should be able to tell. Okay. The question can be like that. That is the end of amino acids. That is the end of your amino acids. Every single point of NCRT has been covered. Previous year question has been asked. Done and dusted. Now, can we start? Can we start lipids? Can we start lipids? Tell me in the chat right now. Can I start lipids? In a ch lipids? Can I start lipids? I want everyone to drink some water now. Drink some water. Refresh yourself completely. Yes, refresh yourself completely. And we will start now the lipids now. Students, this is going to be a very long lecture today. I am telling you right now, if you are weak hearted, if you do not want your marks, if you do not want to learn biochemistry, you can go right now. You can go right now, leave the class, go out. Later on, you can, you'll, you'll be like procrastinate, but you'll never understand. But if you want those marks, I want every student today to watch till the end. Why till the end? Because the end part of this chapter is your enzyme mechanism. Questions will always come from enzyme mechanism. Okay, so watch till the end. Okay, now. Next concept. As a kids, as kids, how many of you tried to mix water and oil? Yes, tell me in the chat right now. How many of you tried to mix water and oil? Tell me in the chat right now. How many of you have actually tried to mix water and oil? You know, water and oil mixing. Is it able to, are you able to mix water and oil? Yes. I have tried to mix it. So you take a bottle, you take a bottle, okay. Add oil to it. Add oil and add water. Now, if you leave it as such, if you leave it as such, your oil will float on top of water. Yes. Now, what do you do? You completely shake it. Completely shake the bottle. After some time, the liquid inside will become whitish. Have you noticed that? When you completely mix water and oil, after some time, the liquid, your inside liquid will become white. What is that white color liquid now? That white color liquid is nothing but a type of emulsion. What is an emulsion? Emulsion is a type of a phase where two immiscible liquids are mixing. Yes, two immiscible liquids are mixing. That is called as emulsion. Now, chat, anyone who can tell me in the chat, which is the most purest emulsion in the world? The most purest emulsion in the world is your milk. Is your milk. Is your milk. How many of you drink, all of you drink milk, right? All of you drink milk. When your mother boils the milk and after some time, if you notice, on top of the milk, do you see certain yellow yellow color substance? That yellow yellow thing is nothing but a lipid also called as fat. It is the fat. It is the cow's fat. The milk is there and the fat which you see there is the yellow yellow part. Why? Because when you heat it right, when you are heating the milk, when you are doing pasteurization, what is happening? Water is evaporating. So more fat is left out. That fat is on the top of the milk. That is your lipids. That is your lipids. So usually, usually your lipids are what? Insoluble in water. But under certain conditions, under certain conditions, you can mix. You can mix the milk. You can mix the, you can mix your oil plus water. Now, 
the same question which we had before. What was the question before? Lipids weigh less than 800 Daltons, but still they are present in acid insoluble pool. Yes, they are less than 800. But why are they in acid insoluble? Because I told you in the starting, I told you in the starting, your lipids form what? Lipids, lipid forms vesicles. Lipids forms vesicles and these vesicles are insoluble. The least uh, lip these vesicles are completely insoluble in acid. That is why you find lipids in the case of your acid insoluble fraction. See here, the complete gang of lipids, complete gang. This complete gang, even though the weight is less than 800 atoms, you will find it in the acid insoluble pool. Now write down few points about lipids. Can we write down few points about lipids? Now tell me in the chat, is lipids organic or inorganic? Lipids are your organic compounds. Lipids are your organic compounds. Yes. What about their molecular weight? Molecular weight is less than 800 Daltons. Yes, less than 800 Daltons. Are they soluble in water? They are actually insoluble in insoluble in water. Yes, they are insoluble in water. Like your amino acids. I told you amino acids will form a complete chain. Amino acids will make a long chain. That is called as polymerization. Can lipids do polymerization? The answer is no. That is not polymeric. They are not polymeric. They are not polymeric. Right? They are not polymeric in nature. Clear? Clear? Now, but if they are not polymeric in nature, vessels is, see students, vessels is completely different. Where lipid, lipid is joining. What is a lipid? Lipid is basically an ester. Lipid is basically an ester of your uh, carboxylic acid as well as your alcohol. Yes, carboxylic acid as well as alcohol is ester, an ester. When low, so many lipids join, they form a gang. But that is not made of monomeric units. That is not made up of monomeric units. Remember that. They are what? Not polymeric in nature. They are not polymeric in nature. Now, if you want to classify, if you want to classify your lipids, Lipids can be classified broadly into three different categories. Three different categories. That is simple lipids, compound lipids, as well as derived lipids. But sir, NCRD does not classify like this. Students, the reason I'm classifying like this is for your understanding. Because the simple lipids can be classified into, simple lipids can be classified into your fatty acids, fatty acids as well as glycerol as well as glycerol simple lipids can be further classified into fatty acids as well as glycerol then we have compound lipids i'll tell you what are compound lipids then we also have something called as derived lipids now let's understand simple lipids let's understand simple lipids the first type of simple lipid is nothing but your fatty acids now you might have heard Fatty acid is present there. Omega-3 fatty acid. Omega-6 fatty acid. But what is a fatty acid? What is the definition of a fatty acid? Sir, tell me in, in, right now, what is the structure of a fatty acid? Students, fatty acid is nothing but, fatty acid is nothing but your, is a type of your carboxylic acid. Fatty acid is nothing but carboxylic acid. Fatty acid is nothing but Carboxylic acid, carboxylic acid plus a functional group. So what is a fatty acid? Fatty acid is nothing but a carboxylic acid plus a functional group. That is a R group. Now this R can be anything. This R can be anything. It can be methyl. It can be methyl. It can be ethyl or it can be any carbon number or it can be 
any carbon number all the way from 1 to 19 number all the way from 1 to 19 this can be any type of CH2 any type of CH2 that is all the way from all the way from 1 all the way from your 1 to 19 carbons this R can be all the way from 1 carbon to 19 carbon so you take a carboxylic acid plus a functional group that is your fatty acid that is your fatty acid see if you write the structure of this if you write the structure of this it will come out like this C double bond OH carboxylic acid plus a functional group this R is nothing but this R is nothing but a hydrocarbon is a hydrocarbon this is your nothing but your carboxylic group carboxylic group and in total in entire thing is called as what entire thing is called as your fatty acid fatty acid structure this is the structure of your fatty acid this is your acidic part this is your hydrocarbon which is a functional group that is a fatty acid what is a fatty acid carboxylic acid plus and R group that's all sir any doubt here students any doubt here someone is asking me some doubt here this is stupid to ask but it's okay to tell me new NCRT page number of this topic uh, I don't know I don't know the page number but uh, page number I don't remember someone is telling page number 104 yes it can be page number 104 but I don't know that okay so fatty acid is carboxylic acid plus and R group but can we classify the further can there is there any classification of your fatty acid yes there is a classification fatty acid can be further classified into your unsaturated fatty acids as well as your saturated fatty acids now what is your unsaturated fatty acids listen to me very carefully your saturated fatty acids have your only and only single bond they are made up of only single bond like your alkanes it alkanes alkanes have single bond now this your unsaturated fatty acids can have your double bond double bond or triple bond double bond or triple bond like your alkenes and alkynes alkenes and alkynes now this apart from your single bond saturated fatty acids have melting point the melting point is very high here melting point is very high but for your unsaturated fatty acids the melting point is actually less the melting point is actually less for your unsaturated fatty acids now again for your saturated fatty acids they are solid at room temperature they are completely solid at room temperature yes solid at room temperature now what about your unsaturated fatty acids unsaturated fatty acids are liquid at room temperature liquid at room temperature yes but, for, but sir how will I remember this give us an example no give an example then we can relate the example is very simple listen to this the example here is butter or ghee if you notice butter or ghee is actually solid at room temperature yes butter or ghee is solid at room temperature and your butter or ghee for it to melt completely temperature needs a lot of temperature is required but your cooking oil but your cooking oil which you use in your house cooking oil is it liquid at room temperature yes sir cooking oil is liquid at room temperature yes and melting point is very low if you put if you add the cooking oil within you know one minute oil will become super hot the melting point is very low here that is your saturated fatty acids as well as your unsaturated fatty acids sir is there any examples here yes sir there is examples here now students in the exam in the exam they will ask you let me where is the remote I keep forgetting the remote in the exam they will ask you any of the following statements yes they can ask you any of the following statements but they can also ask you they can also ask you examples yes Rakshita they can ask you examples also now example here is very easy example they will not ask you butter or ghee 
एग्जाम्पल दे विल नॉट आस्क यू बटर और घी दे विल नॉट आस्क यू कुकिंग ऑयल एग्जाम्पल दे विल आस्क यू प्रॉपर एग्जाम्पल्स द एग्जाम्पल्स फॉर योर सैचुरेटेड फैटी एसिड इज पालमेटिक एसिड एज वेल एज स्टेरिक एसिड पालमेटिक एसिड एज वेल एज स्टेरिक एसिड स्टेरिक एसिड यो पालमेटिक एसिड इज सिक्सटीन कार्बन दिस इज वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट very important why because in the examination they will ask you they will tell you palmitic acid 20 carbon is it correct no because we know what do we know palmitic acid is 16 carbon stearic acid is 18 carbon it is 18 carbon these are the two examples for your saturated fatty acid just like that do we have example for your unsaturated fatty acids the answer is yes for unsaturated fatty acids also we have examples that is your oic acid linolenic acid linole linolenic acid linolenic acid also arachidonic acid now this arachidonic acid is a 20 carbon compound it is a 20 carbon acid 20 carbon fatty acid it is a 20 carbon fatty acid with 20 carbons that is including the carbonyl carbon car carboxyl carbon so 20 carbon so do we need to study the only examples not the structures yes not the structures only and only the examples only examples you need to study so the examples for your saturated is palmitic acid 16 carbon stearic acid 18 carbon for your unsaturated unsaturated example for 20 carbon is arachidonic acid apart from that we have certain other examples that is your oleic acid linoleic acid linolenic acid as well as your arachidonic acid all these three are what 18 carbon they are 18 carbon here now there is one small concept here the small concept here is something called as your mufa and pufa what is mufa and pufa mufa is something called as your mono unsaturated fatty acid what is pufa pufa is your poly unsaturated fatty acid unsaturated fatty acids can further be divided into mono unsaturated the meaning of mono is one if there is a single double bond in the structure if there is a single double bond it is called as mufa the example is only example for mufa is your oic acid it has a only one double bond only one double bond in structure that is the example for mufa what is about pufa pufa is your poly unsaturated poly means many many right poly means many if there are many more than one double bond it's called as pufa poly unsaturated fatty acids two three double bond four double bond examples is your pufa example is linolenic acid linoleic acid arachidonic acid they have more than one double bond in its structure clear is it clear shiv kumar is it clear everyone what is the difference between muf mufa and pufa pufa means only single double bond pufa means multiple double bond in the case of your three examples which is given here clear amazing now let me ask you one more thing how many of you use olive oil in your house how many of you use olive oil all the rich people use olive oil very expensive oil yes very expensive oil olive oil how many of you use olive oil in your house they tell the reason olive oil is so expensive the olive oil is so expensive because olive oil is said to be very healthy yes olive oil is said to be very very healthy now why do you call olive oil healthy have you ever wondered have you ever wondered why olive oil is healthy in nature the reason here is your olive oil contains first of all it is a cooking oil it is a type of cooking oil yes it is a type of cooking oil cooking oil means it has unsaturated fatty acid yes it is unsaturated fatty acid the type of fatty acid the type of fatty acid which is present here is your pufa the fatty acid which is present here is pufa now this fatty acid which is present here has a lot of antioxidant properties a lot of antioxidant as well as omega 
omega fatty acids it has lot of omega fatty acids omega fatty acids omega fatty acids you might have learned right there are certain pills which gives us omega 3 fatty acids this olive oil also has the omega fatty acids also has pufa and this particular olive oil this particular olive oil will de completely destroy the bad cholesterol in your body what is bad, bad cholesterol the low density lipoprotein the low density lipoprotein that is the bad cholesterol is completely destroyed by your it's a bad cholesterol is less by in less in the case of your pufa pufa has the less quantity of your cholesterol so it will decrease the cholesterol and also provides antioxidant properties and also omega fatty acids which is good for your health some of the some of students some of students you might have understood you might have seen some of the people even apply olive oil on the face yes why do they apply olive oil on the face because it has antioxidant properties okay antioxidant properties now that is fatty acids is done fatty acids is done now let's understand what is glycerol what is the meaning of glycerol fatty acids were acids it is made up of glycerol it is sorry, it is made up of your fatty acids made up of your carboxylic acid now what is glycerol then what is glycerol you might have understood when you get a cut in your mouth when you get a cut in your mouth your mother or doctor says apply glycerin on top of it yes apply glycerin like glycerin glycerol is a type of alcohol glycerol is a type of alcohol with glycerol is a type of alcohol with it is a three carbon it has three carbon five hydrogen and three OH groups glycerol is a type of alcohol which has three carbon five hydrogen and three OH group can we draw the structure now the structure here is very simple the structure here is how many carbons I told you three carbons one carbon two carbon and three carbon how many OH groups three OH groups one OH here one OH here and one OH here now adding the hydrogens one hydrogen here one hydrogen here one hydrogen here one two hydrogens here so how many hydrogens one two three four five so five hydrogens three OH and three carbon so this is the structure of your glycerol so glycerol has another name also the other name for glycerol the other name for glycerol is nothing but your trihydroxy trihydroxy propane it's also called as your trihydroxy propane trihydroxy three hydroxy groups and also called as propane why propane because three carbons three carbons that's why it's called as trihydroxy propane trihydroxy propane that is your glycerol now same glycerol the same glycerol if you notice the bottle if you notice the bottle of the glycerine is it colorless or colorful it is colorless it is colorless when you apply the glycerine do you find some sweet taste yes glycerol is also your it is sweet in taste it is sweet in taste sweet in taste that is your glycerol now the next question is the next question here is how are glycerols and fatty acids attached i told you simple simple lipids have two types glycerol and fatty acids but this glycerol and fatty acids can completely join together but how do they attach sir can you give me a structural or can you do a structure for me yes i can so next job is for all of you to is write down the structure with me write down the structure with me okay now <clears throat> glycerol and fatty acids can combine together in a process called as esterification in a process called as esterification so what is esterification here we have your glycerol take your glycerol here OH 3 carbon OH and OH 
we have H2 here, single H and H2 here. This is your glycerol. <coughs> this is your glycerol. Plus, to this glycerol, add a fatty acid. What is a fatty acid? Fatty acid is nothing but a uh, fatty acid is nothing but your carboxylic group. A carboxylic group such as your take one example. Let's take um, 16 was your palmitic acid. Nah, take 16 one. CH3, CH2, uh, 30, 16 is uh, 2 plus 1, uh, then it will be 14 and COOH, 14, 15 and 16, yes, this is your palmitic acid, this is your palmitic acid, so when we combine, when we combine your glycerol and palmitic acid, this OH here, this H here, this O, oh, let me draw it and show. This OH will form a bond with the H here. Yes, this OH will form a bond with H and water is completely released. Yes, water is, let me leave that aside, H2. H2, H, H2. Now this particular, here O will attach with this here. This O will attach with there. So can we write O, C, double bond O, C, double bond O, CH2, CH3, CH2, 14 times. This is what we get. Now when glycerol joins with palmitic acid, when a glycerol attaches with a fatty acid, we get a structure called as glyceride. We get a structure called as your glyceride. One second. This is correct, no? There's no mistake here. So, glycerol plus fatty acid. Glycerol plus fatty acid is glycer ride now if you notice here i just substituted we only added one fatty acid yes in your glyceride here in this particular glyceride we only added only one fatty acid that is why this is called as mono here that's why it's called as your monoglyceride it's called as monoglyceride because only one r group only one fatty acid was attached to the alcohol that is formed by the condensation what is condensation reaction condensation reaction is a reaction where we combine two molecules is given two molecules fuse together to get a new molecule with the release of water monoglyceride formation of one fatty acid if only one fatty acid is attached monoglyceride if there are two fatty acids if we add a fatty acid here also see if this instead of this O, if we add another fatty acid here, that becomes diglyceride. Now, at even the third position, even at, if you take out this also and add a fatty acid here, add a fatty acid here, it becomes here also on fatty acid. If you add three fatty acids, if you add three fatty acids, it becomes triglyceride. It becomes what? Triglyceride. What is triglyceride? Triglyceride is a structure formed by condensation of three fatty acids and glycerol so glycerol plus fatty acid is glyceride if only one fatty acid is used it's called as monoglyceride if two fatty acids are involved it's called as diglyceride if three fatty acids are involved it's called as triglyceride it's called as what triglyceride is that clear to all of you is the concept of triglyceride to clear all of you see can you see the difference here difference between your fats and oils this can be your, both can be triglycerides solid room temperature liquid at room temperature mainly from your animals oils are mainly from your plants relatively more saturated or relatively more unsaturated high melting point low melting point example is ghee here is oil is the example for your oil that is cooking oil that is a cooking oil now what is compound lipid I told you simple lipid simple lipid is a type of lipid which only has glycerol as well as fatty acid now what is compound lipid compound lipid will have a separate extra what is extra here 
simple lipid compound lipid will have fatty acid plus alcohol group plus an additional group an additional group this additional group can be a phosphate or a sugar yes this additional group can be a phosphate or protein or even be a sugar so based on that based on that information your compound lipids can be divided into three different parts that is your phospholipid glycolipid as well as sphingolipid now students glycolipid and sphingolipid is not in your syllabus they have not mentioned it so you need to remember only phospholipid the phospholipid is a type of compound lipid and this is a lipid which will have fatty acid plus an alcohol plus a phosphate will be there a phosphate will be there that is the additional functional group here additional functional group that is a phosphate here in the example the example which is given in your ncert is lecithin the example which is given in your ncert is example which is given in your ncert is for your phospholipid is nothing but your lecithin lecithin is the example which is given in your ncert le lecithin for your phospholipid and this phospholipid can be found in your cell membrane on the cell membrane okay now what about your glycolipids and sphingolipids where do you find glycolipids and sphingolipids glycolipids and sphingolipids can be found in your brain so when you cut the brain you know there are two parts one is a gray matter one is a white matter you know the white matter is actually a type of lipid that white matter there in your brain right that white matter is nothing but your glycolipid that is a galacto cerebroside out of your ncrt don't need to remember this this is extra information i'm telling you this is extra information the white matter of the brain is called as because it has whitish fat appearance because of the myelin and the main lipid found in the myelin is called as your glycolipid which is known as galacto cerebro side we also have something cerebro side cerebromide all that is not in your ncrt the only example which you need to know for exam perspective is phospholipid lecithin is a example phospholipid is a example that is lecithin is example for phospholipid which is given in your ncrt clear now <clears throat> simple lipids done compound lipids done compound lipids only one that is phospholipid now what is derived lipids what is derived lipids do you have derived lipids in your ncrt students derived lipids is not given in the text derived lipids is actually given in the diagram the answer which i'm telling you is cholesterol cholesterol is a type of derived lipid cholesterol is a type of derived lipid lipids derived from the simple or conjugate or compound lipid is called as your derived lipids such as your cholesterol it has four closed rings and one open ring is here cholesterol is a tetracyclic in nature tetracyclic in nature cholesterol is a type of your derived lipid clear that is given in your ncrt if you look at the diagram exa example is given now can we read the ncrt can we read the ncrt for your Fa lipids if you tell me the yes sir we can repeat read ncrt i will read the ncrt for all of you read the ncrt with me and you'll be able to revise every single word of ncrt again can we do it <clears throat> i am not seeing any josh only in the chat are all students are you understanding this chapter or not tell me honestly tell me honestly you are understanding no <laughs> if you not understanding i'll repeat i'll repeat again any part you don't understand i'm here for you today i want every student of mine today to understand the chapter by molecules right every single line of ncrt you need to understand okay now lipids are generally water insoluble that was the first line i taught you they are acid insoluble they could be simple lipids simple fatty acids a fatty acids has a fatty acids has a carboxyl group i told you a fatty acid is made up of your 
carboxylic group as attached to an R group. I told you fatty acid plus R group. Fatty acid has a carboxylic group and R group. Fatty acid has a carboxylic group and attached to an R group. The R group could be a methyl, ethyl, or higher number from that is from your 1 to 19 carbon. Done and dusted. For example, palmitic acid has 16 carbons. I told you already, including the carboxyl carbon. The arachidonic acid has 20 carbons. I told you that also 20 carbon atoms, including the carboxyl carbon. Fatty acids could be saturated fatty acids. That is with without the double bond, without the double bond. It is only single bond is there. Or unsaturated. What is unsaturated fatty acids? with only with one or more CC double bond. So unsaturated fatty acids will have double bond. Your saturated fatty acids will have single bond. Another simple lipids is glycerol. Simple lipid type, I told you. Simple lipids, two types. One is your glycerol, other one is your fatty acids. Glycerol, which is a trihydroxypropane, told you already, many lipids have both glycerol and fatty acids. When we combine, when we combine your glycerol and fatty acids, what do we get? Here, the fatty acids are formed, formed esterified. I told you, esterification is happening. Ester bond formation is happening with glycerol. They have to be then monoglyceride and diglyceride as well as triglyceride. What is monoglyceride, triglyceride, triglyceride? Monoglyceride is a glycerol plus fatty acids, uh, esterification is happening, an ester bond is taking place and we get your monoglyceride, diglyceride as well as your triglyceride. Now, these are also called as your fats and oils based on the melting point. I told you melting point also. Oils have a lower melting point. Example is gingerly oil. Very important. The example which is given in your NCRT for low melting point is your gingerly oil and hence remains as oil in winter. Can you think or identify the fat from market? Some lipids have phosphorus in nature. Compound lipids, phospholipids, yes, and phosphorated com organic compounds in them. That is your, these are phospholipids already covered in your NCRT. They are found in the cell membrane, told you. Phospholipids are found in your cell membrane. Lecithin here. Lecithin is a one example, some tissues, especially some tissues, especially in the neural tissues having lipids with a more complex structure, that is your galactocerebroside. It is not given you NCRT, but NCRT is mentioning a line. NCRT is mentioning a line that is galactocerebroside is a for is a type, it is a type of your compound lipid which is found in your brain, which is found in the brain. So students, can you solve the question now? Can you solve a neat PYQ? Can you solve a neat PYQ here? The question is, read the following statements on lipids, on lipids and find out the correct statement. You have to understand lipids, statements are given, find out the correct statement statements. What is the first statement? Lecithin is found in the plasma membrane is a glycolipid you tell me in the chat is it a glycolipid or is it a phospholipid it is a phospholipid so this statement is completely wrong saturated fatty acids possess one or more cc double bond we know your saturated fatty acids will not have double bond saturated fatty acids will only have single bond so this statement is also wrong gingerly oil has a Lower melting point, hence it maintains, remains as oil in winter. Yes, we just learned. Gingery oil is an oil which has low melting point. Lipids are generally insoluble in water, but soluble in some organic solvents. Correct. Lipids can solubilize in organic solvents, but not in water. Then what do we have? Fats. When fats is esterified with glycerol, fats plus glycerol, monoglyceride is formed correct so we have statement number c is correct d is correct and e is correct c d e where here here this is the answer 
This is the answer. Are all of you able to answer the questions? If you are able to answer the question, if the concept is getting clear, I want everyone to like the video, share the video as much as possible. Okay. Now, next question. Following are statements with reference to lipids again. Same type of question. Same type of question that is based on the lipid statements. What are statements? Lipids have having only single bond are called as unsaturated. No, wrong statement. Because if it is only single bond, if it is only single bond, it is supposed to be saturated. Lecithin is a phospholipid. Yes. Trihydroxypropane is glycerol. Yes, other name for glycerol. Palmitic acid has 20 carbon atom including carboxyl. No. Palmitic acid is 16 carbon. Arcodonic acid has 16 carbon. No. Arcodonic acid has 20 carbon. Has a 20 carbon. So which is the statement here? B and C is correct. Anywhere B and C? Here. B and C is correct. Option number A. Option number A. B and C is correct. Amazing. That is your end of your lipids. 5 to 6, 6 to 7. Oh, 2 hours. Not bad. Option number 1. Easy answer. Students, that is the end of your that is the end of your uh, <coughs> lipids. Every line of NCRT has been covered for your lipids. Every line of NCRT is covered for lipids. Done. Before that, amino acids was dead and dusted. Now, can we start with nucleic acids? Can we start with nucleic acids now? Can we start? Before we start nucleic acids, can we take a 10 minutes break? Let's take a 10 minutes break and can we start with nucleic acids? Because we finished 2 hours, mark is done. We still have 2 more hours to go. Before we start the next 2 more hours, let's take a 10 minutes break. Yes, a 10 minutes break and then we will understand nucleic acids. Then we'll understand your structure of protein. After we understand structure of protein, we have your enzyme. Enzyme part is very important. The last part of enzymes that is your mechanism of enzyme and also what is inhibitors. Competitive inhibitors, uncompetitive, non-competitive inhibitors. All of that we'll be learning later on. So let's take a 10 minutes break. What is the time now? The time here is now your um, 6, 7, 10. Let's take it as 7, 10. Let's start at 7, 15. No, 7, 20. Let's start at 7, 20. Break till 7, 20. Break till 7, 20. Okay. Can we take? Can we take break till? Yes, I play uh, football today morning. I played football today. Actually, today... Morning, I went to play football. That's why I'm super tired also little. I should not go to play. I should not go play football on the days of session. I feel now when I have class, I should not go play football that day. That is a bad habit I have. Okay, so break till 720. We'll start exactly at 720. Okay. Amazing. I will also go drink some water. You also go drink some water. Okay. Go drink some water, all of you. We will start at 7.20 exactly. Okay.
So let's start. Is everyone back? Let me know in the chat right now if everyone is back for the next part of the chapter that is your nucleic acids. Yes. Yes, sir. We are back for nucleic acids. Now, <clears throat> students, how is your preparation going on? Let me know in the chat. Let's have a small discussion. How is your preparation going on? Let me know in the chat right now. Is it going really well or, or is, do you have still a lot of backlogs are left? Or your class 12th is left let me know in the comment section i'm reading the comments right now how is your preparation going on right how confident are you with the subject right now which is the subject which is holding you back still because i know some of the students will be like biology i am done sir i am done with biology but sir my physics is lagging a little physics i have so much of to cover or do you have chemistry to cover let me know in the chat but i will tell you one thing whatever backlog you might have whatever syllabus you need to have by the end of February by the end of February please finish your entire syllabus please finish your entire syllabus by the end of February in March and April in March you can do a complete revision again then in the entire month of April you can do test series just do mock test and test series in month of April and by the exam by the time exam comes you will be completely ready okay you'll be completely ready so super six will complete all lessons yes super six will include all the lessons we are doing high weighted chapter first then we are doing the rest of the chapters so that it can help every student out there who is giving a lot of mock tests right now okay so in super six series we'll be covering the entire chapter okay mm. Good now. Yes, the series will complete all the chapters. Do not worry about that. That is our guarantee from our side. So can we start with your <clears throat> nucleic acids? If we can start nucleic acids, show me some energy in the chat. Show some fire, show some energy or some hype in the chat that you are excited to learn the nucleic acids. That is every single line. Right? Every single line you will understand from nucleic acids, the concept and also the NCRT okay cool can we start so tell me what is nucleic acid is nucleic acid a macromolecule or nucleic acid is it a type of micromolecule we know nucleic acid is a type of macromolecule it is a type of macro molecule students if it is a macromolecule will you find it in your acid insoluble portion or acid soluble portion you will find nucleic acids in your acid insoluble yes acid insoluble fraction what about you will find it in filtrate or retentate you will find it in your retentate that is your bio macro molecule if you look at the nucleic acids the main composition of nucleic acid is carbon hydrogen oxygen nitrogen and also phosphorus yes when you look at the structure of when you look at the structures of your nucleic acids you will know that it has nitrogen as well as phosphorus what about the molecular weight the molecular weight of your nucleic acids is more than 1000 daltons yes the molecular weight is more than 1000 daltons so nucleic acid is made up of Nucleic acid is a type of polymer. So if I were to ask you, if I were to ask you, what is the monomeric unit? What is the repeating subunit? In the case of your nucleic acid, the answer should be nucleotide. The answer should be, it is a polymer of nucleotide. It is a polymer of nucleotide. So many nucleotides, many nucleotides attaching one after another forms the nucleic acid so it is a monomer of nucleic acid what is a nucleotide 
न्यूक्लियोटाइड इज नथिंग बट मोनोमर ऑफ न्यूक्लिक एसिड यस इट इज मोन ऑफ न्यूक्लिक एसिड दे कंटेन थ्री कॉम्पोनेंट्स अ न्यूक्लियोटाइड विल हैव थ्री मेन कॉम्पोनेंट्स वॉट आर दो थ्री थ्री मेन कॉम्पोनेंट ऑफ यू न्यूक्लिक एसिड ऑफ योर न्यूक्लियोटाइड इज अ फॉस्फेट शुगर यस अ पेंटो शुगर अ नाइट्रोजनस बेस एंड ऑल्सो अ फॉस्फोइट और अ फॉस्फरिक एसिड सो थ्री मेन कॉम्पोनेंट्स द थ्री मेन कॉम्पोनेंट्स ऑफ यू न्यूक्लियोटाइड इज अ पेंटो शुगर अ नाइट्रोजनस बेस एंड ऑल्सो अ फॉस्फोरिक एसिड ऑल्सो और अ फॉस्फेट ग्रुप सो यू हैव अ पेंटो शुगर ह्यो यू हैव अ फॉस्फेट ह्यो एंड वी हैव अ नाइट्रोजनस बेस नाउ इफ आई वे टू आस्क यू इफ आई वे टू आस्क यू वॉट इज पेंटो शुगर कैन एनी मन चैट टेल मी वॉट इज द मीनिंग ऑफ अ पेंटो शुगर पेंटो शुगर इज नथिंग बट अ फाइव कार्बन मोनोसैक्राइड पेंटो शुगर इज वॉट पेंटो शुगर इज अ फाइव कार्बन मोनोसैक्राइड सेंट्रल मॉलिक्यूल इन योर न्यूक्लियोटाइड यस इट इज अ सेंट्रली प्लेस्ड न्यूक्लियो इन योर न्यूक्लियोटाइड पेंटो शुगर कैन बी ऑफ योर राइबोस और डी ऑक्सी राइबोस इन द स्टार्टिंग इन द स्टार्टिंग आई आस्ट यू वॉट इज द डिफरेंस बिटवीन डी एन ए एंड आर एन ए द डिफरेंस बिटवीन डी एन ए एंड आर एन एज इन द केस ऑफ योर आर एन ए द शुगर हियर द पेंटो शुगर इन द केस ऑफ आर एन ए एज राइबो न्यूक्लिक एसिड यस इन केस ऑफ योर पेंटो शुगर इन केस ऑफ योर आर एन एज राइबो शुगर इज देर एंड इन द केस ऑफ योर डी एन एट इज डी ऑक्सी राइबो न्यूक्लिक एसिड द शुगर विच इज प्रेजेंट हियर इज डी ऑक्सी राइबोस so in case of your rna we have the ribose sugar in the case of your dna we have deoxy ribose sugar but what is the difference what is the difference between ribose sugar and deoxy ribose sugar to understand the difference between the two different sugars you need to look at the structure when we look at the structure of your deoxy ribose look at the structure of your deoxy ribose at the second carbon we only have the hydrogen here we only have the hydrogen but if you look at the structure of your ribose sugar if you look at the structure of your ribose sugar in the second carbon there is oh group oh group that is the structure of your ribose deoxy ribose the oxygen is missing you only have your h that is the structural difference between ribose sugar as well as deoxy ribose sugar and your deoxy ribose sugar is found where in the case of your dna ribose sugar is found in the case of your r n a does everyone know the difference between the dna and rna now dna and rna is simple difference deoxy ribose sugar ribose sugar second carbon only h second carbon o h now what about the nitrogenous bases what are the different types of nitrogenous bases present here nitrogen is the nitrogen containing compounds with a ring structure we have five nitrogenous bases Yes, we have five different nitrogenous bases. One is adenine, thymine, right? AT, GC, guanine, cytosine, uracil. See here, five different types of nitrogenous bases. Out of these five nitrogenous bases, right? Out of five nitrogen bases, your adenine, guanine, and cytosine are the common. These three are common in the case of your DNA and RNA. While your thymine. will be found in the case of the dna thymine will be found in the case of dna uracil will be found in the case of your rna that is at bond is there and gc bond is there in the case of your dna in the case of rna instead of thymine we have the uracil we have the uracil instead of thymine in the case of rna now how do we remember this how do we remember what are purines and what are pyrimidines now i'll small tell you a small trick the small trick here is air is pure the small trick here is air is pure the a stands for adenine the a stands for adenine a stands for adenine and pure stands for purines the p stands for your purines so air is pure p 
P P is pure stands for purines, and A stands for adenine. You also know air is a mixture of gases. Air is a mixture of gases. So what is which is the nitrogen base? We starting from G. The nitrogen base which is starting from G is guanine. So air is again a mixture of gases. Mixture of gases. From G we have only one nitrogen base that is guanine. That is your guanine. That is guanine. So in purines, in purines we have two different types of pure purines. Two different nitrogen bases. We have guanine and we have adenine. Now you, if you have read the NCERT or if you have saw some questions, there might be a question like. They will give you options of nitrogenous bases, and they will ask you to identify which of the following amino, which of the following nitrogenous bases is a double ring structure. And that time you should remember, Baswarat sir told me, purines are double ring structure, ring number one, ring number one, and ring number two. So your purines are double ring structures. That is the answer. So options they might have given you guanine or adenine. You have to blindly tick on adenine or guanine, which are purines which have double ring. Okay. Now what about adenine? What about pyrimidines? What about pyrimids? Pyrimidines. Pyrimidines. One more simple trick is there. You cut the pyramid. You cut the pyramid. Cut the pyramid. What is C? C stands for your Cytosine C stands for cytosine. U stands for uracil. T stands for thymine. T stands for thymine. U stands for uracil. The C stands for your cytosine. Cut the pyramid. So pyramid is cytosine, thymine, and uracil. Now thymine, thymine, uracil have a single ring structure. They are what? They are single ring structure. Single ring structure. While your purines, where air is pure, adenine and guanines are double ring structure. That is a question. Okay, that can be asked as a separate question. So, if you look at the nitrogen bases, we have purines, we have adenine and guanine. In your pyrimidines, we have your cytosine, thymine, and uracil. Cytosine, uracil. Code pure, pure as gold. So there are certain, there are other tricks. There are so many other tricks. I told you the trick which I use, like air is pure or something like that. Pure gold also can work. Okay. Now we have what is nucleoside then? Nucleoside is nothing but nucleotide minus the phosphate group. So nucleotide minus the phosphate. When we minus the phosphate, what do we have? We have the nitrogenous base. We have the sugar. So sugar is here. Sugar. Plus the nitrogenous bases nucleoside, nucleoside. So nucleotide is what? Nucleotide is what? Nucleotide is phosphate plus sugar plus base. What is nucleoside? Nucleoside is your sugar plus base. Sugar plus base. Now what is the bond? What is the bond between your nucleotides? That is your ester bond. Ester bond formed between the Phosphate group of one nucleotide. Phosphate group. The phosphate group here. Can you see the three prime of this carbon has a bond with the phosphate group. So one bond between a phosphate group of one nucleotide. Phosphate group of one nucleotide and hydroxyl group of sugar. See, this is your phosphate group from this. This is one nucleotide here. This is one nucleotide here. The phosphate group from one nucleotide is forming a bond with the hydroxyl group. Hydroxyl group of sugar of next nucleotide. So it is a phosphodiester bond. For ester bond is a bond between your phosphate as well as your one nucleo phosphate as well as your sugar. Phosphate as well as your sugar. Clear? That is your phosphodiester bond. Why is they saying diester bond? Because there are two bonds happening simultaneously. Two bonds happening simultaneously. Clear? 
Now, what is the difference between DNA and RNA? I told you already. DNA is double standard. RNA is generally single standard. Then we have bases here. Thymine, cytosine, adenine, and guanine. We have your uracil, cytosine, adenine, and guanine. The only difference between DNA and RNA is your uracil in the case of your RNA. Thymine in the case of DNA. 3 prime, 5 prime, phosphorus to bond. 3 prime from here, 5 prime from here. Now, can we read the NCRT for your uh, nucleic acids? Can we read? Tell me in the chat right now if we can read NCRT. Students, the reason I'm not telling you much here, the reason I'm not telling you much about your phosphodiester bond or your nucleotide nucleoside is because you will be learning that in detail in your molecular base of inheritance. Right? You'll be studying again there in detail. But right now, it is less. Right now, it is less. Just the basic information right now. But in detail, you'll be learning in your molecular base of inheritance. Okay? Let's read the NCRT lines. NCRT lines, NCRT spotlight. Living organisms have number of carbon compounds in which heterocyclic rings can be found. Yes, carbon with your heterocyclic rings, that is your purines and pyrimidines. Some of these are nitrogenous bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, uracil and thymine are your different types of your nitrogenous bases. Then we have where, when found attached to sugar, they are called as nucleoside. What is a nucleoside? Nucleoside is nothing but your sugar plus the nitrogenous base. If a phosphate group is also found, esterified, see ester bond is there. Whenever there is phosphate, ester bond formation, esterified to the sugar, then they are called as nucleotide. Okay. The adenosine, guanosine, thymidine, uridine, and cytidine. D I N E. Whenever there is D I N E, it is a nucleoside. It is a nucleoside. Can you see the? Can you see the suffix here? The suffix here is T I D E, S I N E, S I N E. So whenever there is a suffix ending with I N E, it is a nucleoside. It is a nucleoside. Then, adrenalic acid, thymidinic acid, guanic acid, uridic acid, and cytidinic acid. Whenever there is acid in your suffix, that is a nucleotide. That is a nucleotide. Are your nucleotides. So, if they give you an example, you should be able to identify which is a nucleotide, which is a nucleoside. Okay, now nucleic acids are like DNA and RNA consist of nucleotides only. Remember that nucleic acids, your nucleic acids only has nucleotide. There is no nucleoside. Remember that point very well. Only nucleotide DNA and RNA functional as genetic material. They function as genetic material. Now, if you look at the NCRT. We have the sugars, which I'll be, this I'll tell you later. See here, palmitic acid, structure is given here. 16 carbon, palmitic acid. Then we have glycerol. We learn the structure of glycerol. Yes, the trihydroxypropane. Then we have triglyceride here. If you notice in your triglyceride, if you notice in your triglyceride, all the three functional groups are there. See, we have one fatty acids, second fatty acid, and third fatty acid. In your triglyceride, there are three fatty acids. Then we have your cholesterol, which is a derived lipid. Yes, it's a derived lipid. Then we have your phospholipid, example as lecithin. This part here is the lecithin part. This is the lecithin part, which is a phospholipid, which is a type of compound lipid. Okay. See here, amino acids. In the starting, we did write amino acids. Glycine, single H. Alanine, CH3, serine, CH2OH. So students, if you ask me the structures which you need to understand and write down and practice are these are the following structures. Apart from these structures, nothing will else be asked. Apart from these structures, nothing else will be asked. So these structures are the most important structures for you. Clear? Now, other structures are here. Adenine, 
which is a purine. Yes, we learned the structure. Remember, purine is double ring. Then we have uracil. Uracil is a pyramid, a single ring structure. Single ring structure. Then we have adenosine, uridine. Adenosine and uridine are nucleotide. See, nucleoside, 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 nucleoside. Then we have your nucleotide, means there should be an acid attached to it. Adin adenosinic acid, it's called a nucleotide because there is an acid group here. That is a nucleotide. Nucleoside will have what? I N E, I N E. Clear? If you have understood till now, if you have understood till now, please like the session right now and share the session right now. And sir, this session we may go five hours. Yes, MD Ashok, do you want me to increase the speed? Tell me, do you want me to increase the speed? If I increase the speed at this point, right? Some of the students who are watching the session for the first time, someone is watching the session for the first time, they might not understand these concepts. I am making the session so detailed for everyone so even if you're watching the session for the first time ever you should be able to understand the session okay clear uh -huh. now next concept is your metabolites concept next concept is your metabolites concepts so i am going to go in the same pace i want everyone to understand with me okay now the next concept is metabolites what are metabolites now students inside your body students inside your body there are many reactions are happening yes there are many reactions are happening there could be catabolism there could be anabolism together they are called as metabolism yes in this metabolism there are certain reactants the reactants in the metabolism are called as metabolites so what are metabolites metabolites are the reactants which are involved in the metabolism clear metabolites are the reactions involved in the metabolism now metabolites can be of two types one is your primary metabolites one is your primary metabolites the other one is your secondary metabolite yes primary metabolites as well as your secondary metabolite now what is this primary and secondary metabolites primary metabolites Listen to me, they are involved directly in the growth. For example, we have always been learning. Your proteins are your building blocks of the body. In order to an organism, if your organism has to grow and develop, it needs the biomolecules. Those biomolecules which are involved directly in the growth of the organism, that is your primary metabolites. Example is your carbohydrates, lipids, proteins and nucleic acids. These are directly involved in the growth, primary metabolites. But then we have secondary metabolites. They are produced for a other function. Secondary metabolites are not involved in the growth. Secondary metabolites have secondary function, such as your protection, as well as defense mechanism, as well as stress response, as well as stress response. And these secondary metabolites are mostly found in the case of your plants mostly found in the case of your plants example is your colored pigments yes carotenoids in the case of your carrot why is the carrot orange in color you tell me carrot is orange in color because of the carotenoids then we have your alkaloids then we have rubber antibiotics antibiotics which are obtained from your fungus yes penicillin then we have gums essential oils scents and spices these are all different types of secondary metabolites. Now here students, the spices, right? Spices are actually the bark. Bark is a secondary metabolite. The chakke, what do you call it? Cinnamon. Cinnamon is a type of your secondary metabolite. Clear? Now, this is the most important table. Most important table from this chapter. Most important table from this chapter is right here. In your examples, listen to me very carefully now. Pigments example is carotenoids, anthocyanins. Carotenoids 
anthocyanins, etc., are the pigments which are a type of your secondary metabolites. Then we have alkaloids. Alkaloids such as your morphines as well as codeine. Morphine, which is used in your pain treatment, if someone is going undergoing cancer, we inject the medicated morphine to reduce the pain. The other example of alkaloid is the nicotine. Nicotine, which is used in cigarettes, right? Cigarettes. Nicotine is also a type of alkaloid. Then we have codeine. Codeine is used in the case of your cough syrup. Oh, oh, cough syrup, you get now cough. In the cough syrup, they add an alkaloid called as codeine, which makes you very sleepy. Okay. Then we have terpenoids, that is monoterpenes and diterpenes. Then you have essential oils, lemongrass oil. You know, right? Some of them want to reduce the weight, right? When someone wants to reduce the weight, they uh, take up a lot of uh, grass oils and everything. That's your essential oils. Then we have certain toxins, certain toxins, such as your abrin and ricin. Abrin and ricin. Now, this is a famous example. Ricin here is a very famous example. Why? How many of you watched Breaking Bad? How many of you watched Breaking Bad? How many of you watched Breaking Bad? Breaking Bad is a series which you don't watch right now because you're preparing your NEET syllabus. Once your NEET is over, that time you can watch Breaking Bad. In Breaking Bad, there's a character called as Walter White. Walter White makes up a toxin. He makes a, to a to toxin from your uh, caster. That toxin is called as your ricin. Same toxin. That is the ricin here. Abrin is also other type of your toxin. Then we have lactans. That is concavalin A. This is a neat PYQ. Neat PYQ. Yes. Then we have drugs such as your winblastin and curcumin. Right? Winblastin and curcumin. This winblastin. This winblastin is actually a type of anti-cancerous agent and this winblastin is actually obtained from a plant called as vinca rosa the pink color flowers you see on the road right pink color flowers white color flowers pink color flowers white color flowers that is vinca rosa from there we obtain winblastin is an anti-cancerous agent what is curcumin curcumin is obtained from your curcumin longa that is your uh, turmeric curcumin longa turmeric then we have polymeric substances such as rubber, gums and cellulose. Students, why am I explaining such all the things? Because when you try to buy heart, it becomes very difficult. But if you know the significance, if you know the significance of each one of them, right? You can understand very well. Terpenes are what? Terpenoids are basically your isoprene units, long chain of isoprene units. Clear? Clear? Is this table to clear all of you? If this table is clear to all of you, let's go to the next concept. That is a question for all of you. Question. What is the question? Which of the following is not, not a secondary metabolite? This is a neat PYQ. Neat PYQ. I'll give you 10 seconds to answer the question. No more drama. Focus. <clears throat> 10. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Time's up. What is the answer? Which is your not a secondary metabolite? Lecithin here. One imposter. Lecithin is the imposter here. Lecithin is a phospholipid. What is it even doing here? What is your lecithin even doing here? Lecithin is a type of your phospholipid. Right? It is a type of phospholipid now next question next question is a match the following question they have given you list a list b you need to mark which is what i'll give you 20 seconds solve the question take your time solve the questions 20 seconds 20 seconds let me read the answers now let's see who gives the answer first now let's see who gives the answer first suresh sarat spurti vishu vishnu Let's see who can answer the first. Adenine. Is adenine a purine? Yes, adenine is a purine. Anthocyanin is a pigment. Yes, second option done. Chitin is a polysaccharide. Done. Codeine is an alkaloid. That is a very easy question, no? Very easy. Chitin is a polysaccharide. What is the answer? A is 4. Huh? 
so these two are gone a is 4 b is 1 here only an answer no? correct so, two options only what the answer a is 4 b is 1 who was the first person who answered first who answered the first i don't remember i didn't see the chat chat went away but students this is the answer now next question see i have included less questions because the cons based on this concept of secondary metabolites there are many questions many questions based on your secondary metabolite okay ritesh so all of you try to answer such questions which of the following is not a secondary metabolite in plant when blasting a curcumin rubber gums morphine codeine amino acids and glucose very simple answer amino acid and glucose are your primary metabolites they are primary metabolites clear now can we start with carbohydrates that is the end of that is the end of your nucleic acids and metabolites is over metabolites is over any doubt till now you can ask me students are all of you understand the chapter biomolecules is a very easy chapter if you understand and and write down okay very easy chapter okay so can we start with carbohydrates now very easy chapter right very very easy chapter so write down with me and understand the next point next concept that is your carbohydrates can we start carbohydrates can we start the carbohydrates now what is carbohydrates the uh, the topic the topic itself is telling you carbohydrates are hydrates they are hydrates of carbon they are hydrates of carbon carbohydrates are hydrates of carbon they are hydrates of carbon your carbohydrates usually have multiple they usually have multiple oh can you see throughout your uh, carbohydrates there are multiple oh groups yes and your carbohydrates mainly has two functional groups that is your aldehyde and ketone group aldehyde as well as ketone group is there now aldehyde is aldehyde and ketone the aldehyde is mainly found in your glucose and ketone is found in your fructose ketone is found in your fructose can you see ketone group here aldehyde group in the case of your glucose and ketone group in the case of your fructose that is the basic that is the basics of your carbohydrates now based on the number of carbons based on the number of carbons we can classify your carbohydrates for example if there is a single right based on number of carbons based on the number of carbons we have something called as monosaccharides it only has one type of sugar then we have disaccharides disaccharides will have two types of sugar then we have your oligosaccharides then we have your polysaccharides now let's understand one by one let's understand one by one what is a monosaccharide monosaccharide is basically simplest carbohydrate and it it is only has one type of carbo one type of your glucose you see only one type only one type of your uh, what do i say carbon here one type of glucose built from your blocks of large carbohydrates mono means single i'll write here single saccharide means sugar if there is only one type of sugar it's called as monosaccharide example is your triose tetrose pentose as, as well as your hexose they only have one type of sugar if there is only one type of sugar it's called as monosaccharide and if there is only one type of sugar you cannot hydrolyze it anymore that is it cannot be hydrolyzed into smaller unit this is the most tiniest unit here you cannot hydrolyze it any further now what is disaccharide disaccharide basically has two types of sugars disaccharides have what di means two saccharide means sugar in the case of your disaccharide it has two types of sugar for example example is very simple if you look at sucrose sucrose is made up of your glucose plus fructose glucose is one type of sugar fructose is another type of sugar so two type of sugars are here now what about lactose lactose is made up of glucose plus 
galactose. Lactose is made up of glucose plus galactose. So in the case of your disaccharides, there are two types of sugars. And these two types of sugars are bound together by a bond called as glycosidic bond. They have what? They have glycosidic bond between them. Okay. Now what is oligosaccharide? Oligosaccharides are basically a type of sugar where we have more than two types of sugars attached together. That is oligosaccharides are polymers of monosaccharides with three to nine monomeric units. Example is very simple. Example is very simple. That is raffinose. The only example you need is raffinose. That is, it has raffinose has your glucose plus galactose plus fructose. Glucose plus galactose plus fructose is raffinose. Sir, what about your polysaccharides? Students, polysaccharides are of two types again. Polysaccharides are monomers or polymers of monosaccharides with 10 or more than 10 monomeric units. They have many types of monomeric units. They have many types of monomeric units. Someone is asking me in the chat, uh, Sir is asking me, Sir, what do I mean by sucrose is non-reducing? I'll tell you. I'll tell you about reducing sugar, what is non-reducing sugars. I'll tell you all of that. Wait. Okay. Now, what is polysaccharide? Poly means many. So if there are many monomeric units, if a particular sugar is made up of many monomeric units, it is called as your polysaccharide. Yes, monosaccharide, only one monomeric unit. Disaccharide, two monomeric units. Trisaccharide, three monomeric units. Right? When you have polysaccharide, polysaccharide is made up of many monomeric units. And students, please write down. Please write down this flowchart because questions will be asked from this flowchart only. Only from this flowchart question will be asked. That is, polysaccharides is of two types. We have your homopolysaccharide. We also have your heteropolysaccharide. In your heteropolysaccharide, it is made up of different monomeric units. Many different types of monomeric units are there in your heteropolysaccharide. But in the case of your homopolysaccharide, what is the meaning of homo? Homo means same. If the same monomeric unit is repeating, if the same monomeric unit is repeating, it's called as homopolysaccharide, made up of same monomeric unit. Made up of same monomeric unit. Clear? Now, here we have example. In your homopolysaccharide can be further divided. Homopolysaccharide can be further divided into your structural polysaccharide also storage polysaccharide in your structural polysaccharide we have two types which provides the structure to the cell one first one is your cellulose second one is your chitin cellulose is plant based chitin is obtained from your is seen in the case of your hexoskeleton of your arthropods then we have from storage point of view we have starch Glyco starch in the case of your plants, then we have your glycogen. We have also have inulin. Now you tell me in the chat, students. You tell me in the chat. Inulin, is it plant-based or is it animal-based? Do you find inulin in your plants or do you find inulin in the case of your animals, the storage unit? Because I told you, the starch here is the storage unit in the case of your plants. All of us know plants store the food in the form of starch. Humans store the food in the form of glycogen. But what about inulin? What about inulin? Sujita is asking me, is it for knee droppers? Yes, it is for knee droppers for your current knee students. Knee 2025 also you can watch it. Okay. Your inulin is plant based. It is found in the case of your plants. That is your homopolymer. So homopolymer, we have your structural cellulose and chitin. Storage, we have starch, glycogen and inulin. And your heteropolymer. In your heteropolymer, we have your peptidoglycan. The same peptidoglycan layer. 
विच इज फाउंड इन योर बैक्टीरियल सेल वॉल यस इट इज फाउंड इन योर बैक्टीरियल सेल वॉल देन वी हैव योर अगार देन वी ऑल्सो हैव म्यूको पॉलीसैक्राइट बट इन योर एनसीआर टी वी ओनली हैव पेप्टोडोग्लाइकन एज वेल एज अगार ओनली दीज टू आर प्रेजेंट इन द केस ऑफ योर एनसीआर टी पेप्टोडोग्लाइकन इज प्रेजेंट इन योर बैक्टीरियल सेल वॉल ओके नो this is the slide which has the ultimate information ultimate information and there are at least 3 to 4 pyqs on this slide 3 to 4 3 to 4 pyqs on this slide alone now listen to me very carefully now first in the case of your homo polysaccharide in the case of your homo polysaccharide I told you starch for storage that is polymer of glucose starch is a polymer of your glucose reserved food material in the case of plants starch is made up of starch is made up of amylose and amylopectin it is made up of amylose and amylopectin now same amylose and amylopectin i will discuss again when i am teaching you in another experiment i will teach you one more experiment today in the next experiment i'll be telling you what is amylose what is amylopectin okay wait for that then we have glycogen like this is a neat pyq students neat pyq here the polymer of starch is made up of starch is made up of polymer of glucose glycogen glycogen is again polymer of your glucose food reserved in your animals highly branched and stored in your liver and muscle cells done now again a neat pyq again a neat pyq here Inulin is a polymer of fructose. Inulin is a polymer of your fructose. This is right here is a neat previous year question. Okay, inulin is a polymer of fructose, not metabolized in human human body. It is not metabolized in human body. You will find in in your plants and the roots of certain plants, such as your dahlia, dandelions, and arti. choke and your dandelions right dandelions which has the term, uh, wind when, when the wind comes all the seeds will disperse right if you do all the seeds will go away that is dandelions here in those cases you find inulin so this is a neat pyq inulin is a polymer of fructose glycogen polymer of glucose starch polymer of glucose starch is found in the case of a plants glycogen is found in the case of animals now what about cellulose cellulose is also a polymer of your glucose it's polymer of glucose now where do we find cellulose cellulose is found where forms the structural part of the plant that is the plant's cell wall in the plant's cell wall we find the cellulose and it is a straight chain completely unbranched complete straight chain without any branching in the case of your cellulose now what about chitin chitin is a polymer of your n acetyl glucose amine n acetyl glucose amine forms the structural part of the living organs where exoskeleton of your arthropods need pyq again need pyq right it is a complex polysaccharide clear it is a complex polysaccharide students if you tell me right now if there is any doubt in this slide that is your storage polysaccharides as well as your structural polysaccharide we will go to the next concept we will go to the next concept okay if you just tell done sir i am understanding everything now you might be understanding sir i did not write all of this down how will i write all this down don't worry this pdf will be available to you today only on the telegram channel this pdf right here entire information the entire pdf of today's class will be avail available on the telegram channel you can download it for free from there and make your own notes out of this okay done sir done all of you are enjoying all of you are understanding now what about your peptidoglycan Peptidoglycan is actually part of your 
bacterial cell wall remember in your chapter biological classification we differentiated we differentiated uh, bacteria based on we differentiated bacteria based on the layer of the peptidoglycan we had gram positive bacteria gram negative bacteria the same peptidoglycan it is here it is made up of two different repeating units why two different thing why there are two different repeating units because this is a heteropolysaccharide in heteropolysaccharide we have two different repeating units that is nothing but your nag n a g nag and nam nag and nam what is nag nag is nothing but n acetyl glucose amine what is nam n acetyl muramic acid so there is a repetition there is a repetition of your nag and nam and they will keep on repeating that's why they are called as polymers and two different type of monomeric units heteropolysaccharide hetero poly saccharide the other one is your agar it is obtained from your red algae now quickly tell me in the chat if you have done the plant kingdom chapter what is the other name for your red algae is it chlorophyce is it pheophyce or is it rhodophyce 5 seconds take your time 5 seconds tell me red algae is your rhodophyce right that is gelidium as well as glaceria in the economic importance in the economic importance of your agar of your uh, algae i would have mentioned there that is agar it is made up of two different units again two different units that is it is made up of your galactose as well as 3,6 and hydro l galacto pyronase and do you need to remember this answer is no do you don't have to remember this you don't have to remember this they will not ask you in your examination okay they will not ask you in examination i'm telling i'll tell you what to remember this presentation you need to remember everything because there are a lot of previous questions here okay here remember nag and nam because it is present in your biological classification chapter also so you need to remember that okay now what is reducing sugar now can we understand reducing sugar now can we understand reducing sugar so some of you some of students or uh, some teacher will say this is a reducing sugar what is the meaning of reducing sugar but the meaning of reducing sugar is very simple listen to me listen to an experiment listen to the experiments and listen to the experiment then you will understand what is the reducing sugar the same experiment will be conducted in your exam in your college also in the chemistry lab in the chemistry lab so what is the reducing sugar reducing sugar means what a sugar which has free aldehyde and a ketone group so what is the reducing sugar reducing sugar is a sugar which has free aldehyde as well as a aldehyde or a ketone group that is it has a free aldehyde as well as a ketone group for example in the case of your glucose free aldehyde group in the case of your fructose free ketone group in the case of your galactose again a free aldehyde groups and most of the reducing sugar most of the reducing sugars are your monosaccharides and also disaccharides also your disaccharides monosaccharides as well as your disaccharides are your reducing sugar but sucrose is also a reducing sugar sucrose is a disaccharide yes sucrose is a disaccharide but sucrose is not a reducing sugar why because sucrose does not have free aldehyde or ketone group that's why your sucrose is non reducing sugar does not have free aldehyde or ketone now what is the significance of this aldehyde and ketone see take 2 ml of your test solution take a test tube in the test tube you add your glucose which which is a reducing sugar which is a reducing sugar then to that particular solution add equal amount of your benedict solution yes to that you add benedict solution then heat it in water bath when you add in heater ba water bath right what happens reducing sugar reduces reducing sugar reduces the cupric ions 
reducing sugar completely reduce the cupric ions to cuprous ions from the benedict solution that is why your solution becomes brick red precipitate is seen brick red precipitate is seen in the case of your monosaccharides they are called as reducing sugar because they have free aldehyde and ketone and they can reduce they can reduce cupric ions to cuprous ions cupric ions to cuprous ions clear clear that is why they are, they are called as reducing sugar what are non reducing sugar non reducing sugars no free aldehyde or ketone group all polysaccharides all the polysaccharides are reducing non reducing sugar and also your sucrose are non reducing they are called as what non reducing clear clear all of you that is the difference between reducing sugar and non reducing sugar now can we do one more experiment students can we do one more experiment now if you tell yes sir we can do one more experiment if you can tell me yes we can do one more experiment because i have one more experiment for you i have one more experiment for you can we do if you want me to do one more experiment your chemistry experiment which is a neat pyq experiment can we do the next experiment is very simple the next experiment is very very simple what is the next experiment here <clears throat> you take the iodine solution yes we take the iodine solution now to this i take the iodine solution add iodine solution to the starch containing sample so in one test tube we have starch to that starch solution we are adding iodine yes similarly you take another test tube in this test tube add iodine solution to the cellulose containing sample in the first sample in the first sample we have starch in the second sample we have the cellulose till here clear yes now what happens when you add what, what happens when you add iodine to your starch what happens you add uh, once once you add iodine to your cellulose when you add iodine to your starch it becomes completely blue what is this magic the when you add iodine iodine is colorless iodine is colorless little colorless or slight is slight blue color tinges there slight blue color tinges there so iodine is brown actually sorry iodine is brown blue tinges there when we add iodine iodine to your starch you get a complete blue color substance blue color liquid when you add when you add cellulose when you add cellulose to iodine it becomes completely brown in color now what could be the reason behind it the reason behind it is a previous year neat question to understand why this is happening you need to look at the structures here if you look at the structure of your starch if you look at the structure of your starch it has two types of chains your starch has two types of chains the first chain is called as amylose chain the amylose chain has a, amylose is a linear chain with alpha 14 linkage alpha 14 linkage yes amylose is a linear chain but your amylopectin starch has a second part called as amylopectin now this amylopectin is branched this is completely branched that is it has alpha 14 linkage also alpha 16 linkage is there also alpha 16 linkage is there see here can you see alpha 16 this is alpha 16 linkage this right here is alpha 16 linkage that is the branching can you see the branching is between alpha 16 linkage now students you might not be understanding what is alpha 14 what is alpha 16 the alpha 14 which i am mentioning here is the linkage between two two different uh, carbons see here see here this is your monosaccharide this is your monosaccharide this is first carbon this is your first carbon second carbon third four five and six carbon 
Similarly, you have first carbon, first carbon, second carbon, third carbon, fourth carbon. No, no, this is fifth here. Fifth carbon and sixth carbon. Now, when I mean alpha 14 and alpha 16 linkage, alpha 14 and alpha 16 linkage, the linkage is between the two different carbon atoms. Linkage is between two carbon atoms. Let's go back here. Let's go back here. Now, that is the linkage I'm talking about here. Now, in the case of your starch, in the case of your starch, we have amylopectin and amylose. Alpha amylose is a linear linkage, linear, but your amylopectin is branched. Yes, it is branched. But if you look at cellulose, cellulose is completely, cellulose is completely linear. Yes, cellulose is completely linear. Can you see? Completely linear everywhere. Completely linear. That is the hidden answer here. Here, starch can hold iodine. Starch can hold iodine molecule in the helical portion. Imagine you, you are I'm giving you a pen. You're holding the pen with the help of the hand. We have a lot of hands. We are holding the iodine properly. That is why it is blue in color. Why is it blue in color? Because your starch, starch has what? Starch has helical portion. What is the helical portion? The helical portion here is the amylopectin. Amylopectin is the helical portion. That is why it has a lot of branching. The branching will completely hold the starch. But your cellulose, Cellulose does not contain complex helices. Do you see any branching here? Do you see any branching in cellulose? Cellulose does not have any branching. That is, it is completely unbranched. It is completely unbranched. So, hence, it does not hold I2 molecule. It cannot hold iodine. Starch can hold iodine because starch has amylopectin and amylopectin is completely branched and the branching can hold the iodine. But your cellulose, cellulose, right? Cellulose, cellulose is completely unbranched. It cannot hold the iodine. That is why it is brown in color. It cannot hold the iodine. It cannot hold in. But here, Starch has amylopectin, which is the helical portion, and hence it can hold the iodine. That is why positest blue color. Positest blue color. Clear? Clear. Uh, MD is saying starch has helical structure. That is why it's blue in color. It has helical structures, but that helical structure is able to hold. The helical structure is able to hold the iodine. That is why it is blue in color that is what is blue in color based on the structure here starch will show blue color because it is oh, oh, see iodine is actually lightly blue in color lightly bluish in color it is over is it is able to hold iodine that is why positive test here it is not able to hold iodine that's why brown test iodine is completely precipitated or some other reaction is happening the question is here the question is here need 23 question need 2023 question cellulose does not hold blue color with iodine because direct question the cellulose cannot hold the iodine why it breaks down when the iodine is reacted it is a disaccharide, it is helical model, or your cellulose does not contain complex helices and hence cannot hold the iodine molecule. Clear? Need previous equation clear to all of you? Is the need previous equation clear to all of you? That's how you should learn. That's how you should learn. Learn with the exam oriented manner. Okay? Now, this I will give you question later on. This question later on. This question is later on. Now, next question here. Next question. The inulin is a polymer of. Inulin is a polymer of which? 
molecule which acaride fructose galactose amino acid glucose 10 seconds answer the question 10 9 8 7 6 5 4 3 2 1 times up this is also a need pyq students also a need pyq i am not giving you easy questions I am not giving you easy questions. I am making you solve the questions in an easy manner. The answer is your fructose. Fructose is the uh, polymer of your inulin. Easy question? Yes. Next question. The hexoskeleton. The hexoskeleton of your arthropods is composed of. Exoskeleton is made up of. 10 seconds. See, you are able to solve the PYQs in 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, time's up. It is your chitin. It is chitin. Okay? It is the chitin. Chitin is the structure which is found in your exoskeleton of your arthropods. Can we read the NCRT now? Can we read the NCRT with all of you? Can we read the NCRT? Students, if you're able to follow till now, all of you who are watching the video, like the video right now, share the video as much as possible. Now we'll read the NCRT lines, which will make you revise the concept and also understand the concept once again. Okay? Can we revise? I want to see some Josh in the chat for me to teach the NCRT. Students, you might have known. We usually on YouTube, usually on YouTube, NCRT line by line is separate. Yes, NCRT line by line is separate, right? Separate series. Concept is separate series. Previous year question is separate series. On this channel, we have combined everything. One session will give you concept clearing. The same session will give you NCRT lines. The same session will give you previous year questions. Every single thing in one session only, right? One session only, NCRT lines, previous year question papers, and also your concept clearing that's our that's without on eating English so read with me now now here proteins are your polypeptides yes proteins are made up of your polypeptides they are linear chains of your amino acids linked by peptide bound right between the two different between the two different amino acids we have the peptide bond each protein is polymer of your amino acid as there are 20 amino acids Alanin, sustain, proline, tryptophan, lysine, etc. Many are there. A protein is a heteropolymer. This is a very important line. Protein is a heteropolymer. Yes, it's a heteropolymer because it is made up of many different types of monomeric unit. Because remember students, each amino acid, the functional group will change. So each amino acid is different. So many different amino acids are joined together. That is why protein is a heteropolymer. Protein is a heteropolymer. Remember that. Protein is a heteropolymer. Remember that very well. This can be asked as a question. And not a homopolymer. Why? Because heteropolymer, your protein is made up of many amino acids. Amino acids have functional groups which keep on changing. So many different monomeric units. A homopolymer has only one type of monomeric repeating n number of times. This information about amino acid content is important as later you will you in your nutrition lesson you will learn that certain amino acids are essential for our health and they will have to be supplied through our diet that is your non-essential amino acids hence dietary proteins are the source of essential amino acids there are amino acids which which can be essential or non-essential the latter that is non-essential are those which are body can make non-essential body can make while we get the essential amino acids through our diet essential amino acids we get through our diet now the proteins carry out many functions in the living organism some transport nutrients across cell membrane some fight the infection some are hormones some are even enzymes now students i will show you a table i will show you one table which is the second most important table in your biomolecules the first most important table was your secondary metabolites this is the second most important table the second most important table 
in your NCRT. Second most important table. Very important. Very important. What do we have here? We have protein as your collagen. Collagen protein. The collagen protein is your intercellular ground substance. Yes, it forms a network. Yes, collagen forms the network. Then we have trypsin. Trypsin is an enzyme which is found in your small intestine. Yes. Then we have insulin. Insulin is a hormone. We know insulin regulates the blood glucose level. Then we have your antibodies, fights the infections. Then we have receptors. Remember students, antibiotics are also proteins. Right? Antibiotics are also proteins. Insulin hormone is also protein. Trypsin is enzymes. Enzymes are also proteins. Enzymes are also proteins. Then we have receptors. That is sensory receptors, smell, taste, hormone, etc. The last one we have something called as GLUT4. GLUT4 is a structure which helps in transporting the glucose. That is enables glucose transport into the cell. If this is the cell, if the glucose needs to enter into the cell, it will attach itself with your GLUT4 and then only it will enter into the cell. Then only it will enter into the cell. So here, look at here. <clears throat> Look at these lines. Look at these lines here. What lines here? Collagen. Collagen is the most abundant protein in the animal world. Need previous year question. Collagen is the most abundant protein. Collagen is the most abundant protein in the animal world. Animal world, not biosphere. Rubisco, that is Rubisco enzyme. Rubisco enzyme is the most abundant protein in the whole of biosphere. So, students, this is the most important line here. The most abundant protein in your animal world is your collagen. Animal world is collagen. The most abundant protein or an enzyme in your entire biosphere is Rubisco. Now I will ask you one more question. Which is the most abundant carbohydrate in the biosphere? Most abundant carbohydrate. It is actually cellulose. Cellulose is the most abundant carbohydrate because we know cellulose is the part of your plants and plants are so abundant in your living world. Right? So your cellulose is the most abundant carbohydrate. Cellulose is the most abundant carbohydrate which is also found in your fungus also. But protein, protein is your animal world, it is glycogen. In your entire biosphere it is Rubisco. It is Rubisco. Now, let's read the polysaccharides. Polysaccharides are your large macromolecule. Yes, they are large macromolecules. They are acid insoluble pellet. Yes, they will be in acid insoluble. They will be in acid insoluble. Also, polysaccharides, it is carbohydrates as another class of macromolecules. Now, polysaccharides are long chain of your sugars. Polysaccharides are long chain of your monomeric units. They are thread, literally the cotton thread containing different monosaccharides as a building blocks. For example, cellulose is a polymeric polysaccharide it is a polymeric polysaccharide cellulose it is made up of repeating units of glucose yes it consists of only one type of monosaccharide that is glucose so cellulose has a repeating unit linear chain of your glucose right cellulose is a homopolymer yes cellulose is a homopolymer because it only has your Glucose here. Only glucose repeating units. Starch is a variant of this. Starch is a variant of your glucose but present as your storehouse energy in your plants. Remember the flow chart. Remember the flow chart which I mentioned. Your cellulose was your structural homopolysaccharide while your starch, starch is the storage homopolysaccharide. Okay, animals 
have another variant called as glycogen. Inulin is a polymer of your fructose. Yes, in polysaccharides, in your polysaccharides, say glycogen, the right end is called as your reducing end. Oh, I didn't tell you this. In your polysaccharide, right side, here, if this is your polysaccharide, if this is your polysaccharide, the right side, the right side is called as your, in your polysaccharide, the right side is called as your, no, this is, somewhere it was mentioned, somewhere it was mentioned, I, I remember when I was making the slides, mm. somewhere I had written it, I want to show you the diagram, Ha ah, here, here, can you see here, right side is called as reducing, right, R for right, R for reducing end, and the left side, the left side of a polysaccharide is called as your non-reducing end. Now you can ask me, why is the right side called as reducing end? Because it has a free aldehyde group in the case of your right side, it is reducing end. Reducing end, a free aldehyde group, that is R for right, R for reducing end. Left side is called as non-reducing end because it does not have any free aldehyde or ketone. Okay. Here. That is the reducing the reducing end. The left end is called as non-reducing end. The left is called as non-reducing end. Clear? It has branches to show in the form of cartoon which is shown here. Starch forms helical secondary structures. Yes, starch has two types of structures. One is your linear, that is your amylose. Linear is amylose. This is amylopectin. This is branching. Branching is your amylopectin. Amylose and amylopectin. In fact, starch can hold I2 molecules. Previous question. Starch can hold your I2 molecules in the helical portion. The starch I the, the starch I is iodine is a blue in color. Cellulose does not contain complex helicals and hence cannot hold I2. That was the experiment which I told you. Clear? Clear students? Is the point clear to you? This particular paragraph is clear to you? Particular paragraph is clear to all of you? The experiments, two experiments, reducing end, non-reducing end. Starch can hold your I2 because it has side branching. While your cellulose is completely linear, it does not have any branching. Okay. Now, plant cell wall is made up of cellulose. Paper like plant pulp or cotton fiber is cellulose in nature. There are more complex polysaccharides in nature. They have building blocks. Amino or sugar or chemically modified sugar. That is glucosamine. I told you. Glucosamine in the case of your chitin. Then we have N-acetyl galactosamine. Oh, it is not glucosamine, it is galactosamine. Then we have in the exoskeleton of your arthroprots. For example, we have a complex polysaccharide in the case of your chitin. That is your N-acetyl glucosamine. These complexes, polysaccharides are mostly homopolymers. They are mostly homopolymers. Clear? All of you clear here? Clear, tell me clear. If it's clear, I'll go to the next one. In your arthropods, it was homopolymers. Remember, arthropods, it was arthropods. Chitin is a homopolymer. Chitin is a homopolymer. This can be asked as a question. Remember, chitin is a homopolymer. Amazing. Now, nucleic acids, we learned. We finished nucleic acids, right? See, it's a type of macromolecule that one would find in the acid insoluble fraction. Why it is macromolecule? It is found in the acid insoluble fraction of any living tissue in the nucleic acid. These are polynucleotide, monomeric units of your nucleotide. Together with polysaccharides and polypeptides, these comprise the true macromolecules fraction. If someone asks you what are the two macromolecules, the true macromolecules are your polysaccharides as well as your polypeptide. 
right polypeptide now next one is for nucleic acids the building block is your nucleotide what is the nucleotide nucleotide is nothing but your sugar phosphate nitrogenous base and a phosphate group that is your nucleotide a nucleotide has three chemical uh, distinct components one is one is heterocyclic compound the second is your monosaccharide and the third one is your phosphate that is monosaccharide is your sugar heterocyclic is your nitrogenous base and a phosphoric acid or a phosphate that is in heterocyclic compound is nucleic acids are your nitrogenous bases what are heterocyclic compounds are your nitrogenous bases remember nitrogenous bases has that ring structures ring ring structures base they adenine and guanine and uracil thymine and cytosine adenine and guanines are your purines while the rest substituent are pyrimidines the, the skeletal heterocyclic ring is called as purine and pyrimidine respectively the sugar found in the polynucleotide is either ribose sugar ribose is found in the case of your rna deoxyribose is found in the case of your dna polysaccharides pentose or two see polysaccharide pentose is ribose or two deoxyribose deoxyribose in the case of your dna a nucleic acid contains deoxyribose is called as deoxy ribonucleic acid dna while that which contains ribose is called as your ribonucleic acid ribonucleic acid every single line of ncrt we have been covering not just reading here we are covering concept wise now can you solve this question can you solve this question which of the following is the most abundant protein in the animals this is a neat pyq this right here is a neat pyq which is the most abundant 5 seconds 5 4 3 2 1 times up it is your collagen it is your collagen collagen is the most abundant protein in your animal in your entire biosphere it is rubisco enzyme clear now can we start with the structure of protein now can we start can we start with the structure of proteins Five to six, six to seven, seven to eight, eight to nine, eight to ten. Can we start structure of proteins now? Amazing. All of you drink some water. All of you drink some water and get something to eat now. Get something to eat. Go on. Get something to eat for yourself. Take some. Uh, something to eat basically something to eat take something to eat because your brain needs more glucose now because we are learning a lot of concepts the energy capacity of the brain is going down and down and down right that's why i want all of you to eat something so blood glucose level is maintained so eat some we we'll eat some form of glucose now okay now we will start with the structure of protein now we will start with structure of your protein <clears throat> now structure of proteins are basically structure of protein is basically form of your four different types of structures are there that is four levels of protein structures there are if you talk about your structure of protein based on the complexity based on the complexity there are four different levels four different levels four different levels in case of your protein the first one is called as primary structure then we have your secondary structure then we have your tertiary structure then we have your quaternary structure right so what is each one of them listen to my words very carefully all the notes will be provided to you don't worry notes will not run anywhere listen to my words in your primary structure primary structure is a linear structure primary structure is just a linear structure of arrangement of your amino acids just amino acids are arranged amino acids are arranged like this 
फर्स्ट अमाइनो एसिड सेकेंड थर्ड फोर फाइव सिक्स सेवन एट इन योर लीनियर स्ट्रक्चर ऑफ अमाइनो एसिड लीनियर स्ट्रक्चर ऑफ यू प्रोटीन वी अंडरस्टैंड विच अमाइनो एसिड इज प्रेजेंट एट विच पर्टिकुलर पोजिशन दैट इज द सिग्निफिकेंस ऑफ योर प्राइमरी स्ट्रक्चर प्राइमरी स्ट्रक्चर टेल्स एस दिस द विच अमाइनो एसिड इज प्रेजेंट एट विच पोजिशन ना दिस प्राइमरी स्ट्रक्चर राइट दिस प्राइमरी स्ट्रक्चर कैन कंप्लीटली इंटरफोल्ड दे कैन कंप्लीटली इंटरफोल्ड एंड दे कैन प्रोड्यूस योर सेकेंडरी स्ट्रक्चर सेकेंडरी स्ट्रक्चर आर ऑफ टू टाइप्स इन योर प्राइमरी स्ट्रक्चर वी ओनली हैड पेप्टाइड बॉन्ड वी ओनली हैड पेप्टाइड बॉन्ड बट इन द केस ऑफ योर सेकेंडरी स्ट्रक्चर वी हैव हाइड्रोजन बॉन्ड ऑल्सो वी हैव हाइड्रोजन बॉन्ड दैट इज वी हैव टू टाइप्स ऑफ सेकेंडरी स्ट्रक्चर वन इज योर हेल्फा हेलिक्स अदर वन इज बीटा प्लीटेड शीट्स वन इज योर अल्फा हेलिक्स स्ट्रक्चर विच चोज राइट हैंडेड कॉयलिंग विच हैज हाइड्रोजन बॉन्ड लग दिस हाइड्रोजन बॉन्डिंग कैन बी सीन लग दिस हाइड्रोजन बॉन्डिंग कैन बी सीन द अदर वन इज योर बीटा प्लीटेड शीट ना लिसन टू माई वर्स वेरी केयरफुली alpha alpha helix as well as beta plated can undergo complete you know tangling they can completely tangle themselves and they can make a woolen ball like structure that woolen ball like structure is called as your tertiary protein called as your tertiary structure of the protein and this tertiary structure protein is mostly 3d in nature and most of the enzymes which are biologically active are your tertiary in tertiary type of protein most of the biologically active enzymes are tertiary type of protein here we can see hydrogen bonding like before we can also see disulfide bond here we can also see disulfide bond in the case of tertiary here next we have quaternary now till here we only had a single polypeptide chain yes a single polypeptide chain was completely bent and rotated but in your quaternary but in your quaternary structure we have multiple different chains we have multiple different chains of polypeptide so multiple polypeptide chains are coming together and they are making the quaternary structure now let's me revise one more time quickly revise one more time what is primary structure linear chain of amino acids represents the position of your amino acid that is the significance here the n terminal n terminal is called as your where n terminal here the n terminal here we have the n terminal why n terminal because we have your amino group here is called as n terminal then we also have the c terminal in the c terminal we have the carboxylic group see c terminal group is called as c terminal because of the carboxylic group c terminal this is called as n terminal because amine group is there that is your primary structure will have n terminal that is free amine group with the alpha carbon alpha carbon has free amine group c terminal because a free carboxyl group is there that is your primary structure then understood primary structure linear chain of amino acids represents the position of your amino acid okay now what about secondary structure foldings of your polypeptide the polypeptide chain the polypeptide chain will undergo complete folding chain due to the interactions between the amino acids that is formation of your hydrogen bond based on that we have your alpha helix and beta pleated alpha helix is basically your look at this it is a right hand coiling fashion it is a right hand coiling fashion polypeptide chain folds into a form of helix resembling a spring that is your alpha helix then we have beta pleated when you fold a paper when you fold a paper right front back front back if you fold you get one zigzag lines right that is the structure that's how the beta pleated structure looks like of your secondary structure protein so segments of polypeptide chain line up next to each other in resembling pelted paper and between the pelted paper can you see between the pelted paper we have the hydrogen bonding 
देन वी हैव योर टेरिशरी स्ट्रक्चर टेरिशरी स्ट्रक्चर इज थ्री डी स्ट्रक्चर थ्री डायमेंशनल इन नेचर यस यस इट्स कॉल्ड सोलोनॉइड इन दिस इज कॉल्ड सोलोनॉइड राइट इट इज कॉल्ड सोलोनॉइड द प्रोटीन इज फोल्डेड अपॉन इट्स इट सेल्फ नाउ इन योर टेरिशरी स्ट्रक्चर alpha and beta are completely folds onto each other that is called as your tertiary 3d structure which looks like a woolen ball it gives a woolen ball like structure and it is biologically active biologically active now what about and here in the case of tertiary structure we also have disulfide bonds we have your hydrogen bond we have peptide bond we have disulfide bond we also have weak van der waals force here weak van der waals forces are also seen in the case of your tertiary structure <laughs> then we also have quaternary structure what is quaternary two or more polypeptide chains initially until tertiary we only had one polypeptide but from your quaternary in the case of your quaternary we have multiple types of polypeptide example i'll give you one more See, and each one is a subunit. Each one is a subunit here. Now, arrangement of each folded polypeptide chain with respect to each other. The example which is given you in CRT is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a quaternary structure which has four different subunits. What is the meaning of four different subunits? Meaning of four different subunits is it has four different polypeptide chains. So, hemoglobin. Can you see? it has four different polypeptide chain in which we have two alpha chains we have two alpha chains and two beta chains made up of four polypeptide chains example is clear to all of you okay now can we look at the ncrt can we look at the ncrt for this see after this we have the oh answer is seen all over see after this we have the enzyme part after this we have the see if the protein part is over if the protein part is over after this we'll focus on the last part of the chapter that is the enzymes part okay after this we have the enzymes part that is also very easy enzyme part is also very very easy i will teach you how i see till now right till now you might be understanding that everything is easy till now similarly everything will also be easy in your enzyme part also okay now let's see the ncrt lines ncrt line reading time proteins as mentioned earlier are heteropolymers i told you they are heteropolymers not your homopolymers yes of your amino acids the structure of your molecule structure of a molecule means different things in different context but in the case of your but in the case of your biology we have different structures that is structure of a molecule means different different things in inorganic chemistry which you learn from your diksha ma'am in the case of your inorganic chemistry the structure is invariably refers to the molecular formula yes in your inorganic chemistry structure means a formula nacl mgcl organic chemistry always writes the 2d dimension structure yes in organic chemistry we write the 2d structures of the molecule while represent the structure of your molecules example benzene ring naphthalene ring then we have physics 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 conjure up the three dimensional views of a molecular structure while biologists describe the protein structure at four levels see chemistry is doing 2d physics is doing 3d but in biology in biology we learning it in 4d no one more hour one more hour it will be over uh, md it will md will be one more hour it will be over don't worry four more levels that is the sequence of amino acid the positional information in a protein while the first amino acid which is which is second on so on is called as the primary structure what is primary structure the sequence of amino acid so in primary structure we learn about the sequence of amino acid of the protein 
a protein is imagined as a linear the left end is represented by your first amino acid and the right end is represented by your last amino acid the first one is your first amino acid last one is your last amino acid the first amino acid is also called as your n terminal why because of the free nh2 group the last amino acid called as your c terminal amino acid last is called as c terminal why because last is c terminal because a free carboxylic group is there a protein thread does not exist throughout as an extended rigid rod throughout the entire structure protein will not be like your entire line but it will be divided that is the thread is folded in the form of helix the thread can be folded in the form of solenoid or helical nature similar to a revolving staircase of course only some portion of the protein thread are arranged in the form of helix in proteins only a right handed helix are observed i told you only helix is right handed fashion the other regions of the protein thread are folded into a form of what we called as a secondary structure that is beta plated structures others are your beta plated structures a long protein chain is also folded upon itself like a hollow woolen ball the long chain right your alpha and beta are completely folded upon each other called as woolen ball giving rise to the tertiary structure it is giving rise to the tertiary structure this gives us the 3d view tertiary gives us a 3d view of a protein tertiary structure is absolutely necessary for many biological activities of the protein because tertiary structure is biologically active some proteins are assembled more than one polypeptide when there are more than one polypeptide it is called as what quaternary structure the manner in which these individuals are folded polypeptides or subunits are arranged with respect to each other example linear st strings of spheres spheres are arranged upon each other to form the cube or plate this is not important don't worry a structure is quaternary structure of the protein adult hemoglobin consists of your four subunits two of which is identical to each other that is your alpha subunits two other are your beta subunits two subunits are alpha subunits two subunits are beta together constitute the human hemoglobin that is hb human hemoglobin is a quaternary structure remember dynamic state of body no dynamic state body i am not teaching today okay now <clears throat> in polypeptide or a protein the amino acid are linked by your peptide bond peptide bond is formed between the two amino acids it is formed between when the carboxylic group is one amino acid reacts with the amino group of the next one carboxyl and amino acid react with one another that is with release of water that is your gly uh, glycopeptide bond with each other water molecules process called as dehydration in polysaccharides the individual monosaccharides are linked by glycosidic bond so glycosidic bond is formed when your polysaccharides your peptide bond is formed where in the case of your protein long chain of amino acids are joined together by peptide bond now can you solve this question can you solve this question can you solve this question any one of you i'll give you 20 seconds to answer this question a protein is imagined as a line the left end is represented by the first amino acid c terminal and the right end is represented by last amino acid n terminal statement number 1 statement number 2 the adult hemoglobin consists of four subunits two alpha subunits two beta subunits now how many of the statements are correct are both the statements correct or both are wrong is one is correct one is absent tell me in the chat right now you get 10 seconds someone was asking right a pyq on this concept here is a pyq on this concept 10 seconds we can answer the question
आंसर इज डन एनी वन चार टेल मी ऑप्शन नंबर वन वाई इज ऑप्शन नंबर वन करेक्ट बिकॉज यूर एन टर्मिनल द फर्स्ट इज कॉल्ड एज योर एन टर्मिनल बिकॉज इट इज नॉट कॉल्ड एज सी टर्मिनल द फर्स्ट वन इज कॉल्ड एज एन टर्मिनल बिकॉज अ फ्री एन एच टू ग्रुप इज प्रेजेंट and right end represent by last amino acid that is called as not n terminal it is called as c terminal c terminal is last so your first statement is wrong statement second statement is correct next question match the following protein has which type of bond protein has your peptide bond unsaturated fatty acids will have your double bonds nucleic acid will have your phosphodiester bond then your polysaccharides will have your glycosidic bond glycosidic bond clear what are the options here a is 4 sure so this is gone completely this is gone completely a is 4 then uh, b is 1 b is 1 here then uh, c is 2 yes c is 2 phosphodiester bond and d is 3 d is glycosidic bond option number 3 is absolutely correct here next question which of the following if you can't read the question i'm reading it out loud which of the following bond is formed as a result of reaction of carboxylic group of one amino acid carboxylic group of one amino acid or carboxylic group of one amino acid with amino group of other amino acid with the elimination of water which the bond is formed between two amino acids 10 seconds 10 9 8 7 6 5 4 3 2 1 that is peptide bond peptide bond is formed between your two different amino acids clear between two different amino acids we have the peptide bond clear Now we have different types of proteins. We have different types of proteins. We have classification of proteins can be done in many multiple ways. A protein can be classified based on its structure, contractile, nutrient, regularity, defense mechanism, transport, and also the catalytic activity. A protein can do catalytic activity. That is, a protein can become a catalyst. yes a protein can become a catalyst here when a protein that is biomolecules uh, what is a catalyst now what is a catalyst when a protein is performing a function it becomes a catalyst that is it becomes a enzyme but before you understand enzyme before you understand enzyme what is a catalyst can anyone in the chat tell me what is a catalyst in respect to your chemistry with respect to chemistry what is a catalyst catalyst is a substance catalyst is a substance which alter the rate of reaction yes catalyst is a substance which alters the rate of reaction this catalyst can increase the rate of reaction same cat some catalyst can decrease the rate of reaction yes they can do both they can speed up the reaction or they can reduce the reaction both can be done now students tell me in the chat this catalyst can be of organic origin or inorganic origin this catalyst can be inorganic in origin example is your platinum example is your platinum or this <coughs> catalyst can also be organic this catalyst can be also be organic and the catalyst which is organic is called as your enzyme catalyst which is organic is called as your enzyme enzyme is also called as your bio catalyst enzyme is also called as your bio catalyst clear that is the enzyme so now we will be starting off with enzymes 
now we will be starting off with enzymes so can we start students the last part of today's chapter in next one hour just one hour next one hour we will be finishing the entire chapter five hours complete coverage of your biomolecules we started the class at five o'clock five to six six to seven seven to eight eight to nine nine to ten next one hour we'll finish the chapter can we start the last part of today's chapter is the enzymes here we'll be learning here we'll be learning your different mechanism of enzymes different cofactors different types of other substances in your enzyme mechanism so what is an enzyme can we start last one shot <clears throat> last one hour i'll uh, in this last one hour i'll also be making you read ncrt lines so don't worry ncrt lines will be covered again pyqs will be there okay so what is an enzyme i already asked you <clears throat> enzyme is a biocatalyst enzyme is a bio catalyst but what is enzyme made up of enzyme is actually made up of a protein so can i write a line all enzymes all enzymes are proteins yes all enzymes are proteins now before all of you start typing in the chat no sir there are exceptions i will tell you the exceptions wait have some patience all enzymes are proteins but there is except except there is one particular enzyme which is not a protein can anyone in the chat tell me which is the enzyme which is not a protein that is your ribozyme ribozyme is actually not a type of protein ribozyme is a type of enzyme which is a rna enzyme which is a rna enzyme which is a rna enzyme now this ribozyme can be found in the case of your ribosomes in the case of your ribosomes ribozyme is a non protein enzyme is a non protein enzyme it is a rna enzyme which is found in the case of your ribosomes now what is the active site what is the active site the next concept is active site okay now when i was teaching you tertiary structure of protein in the tertiary structure of protein there were many pockets and crevices what are the meaning of crevices the meaning of crevices is small small gaps small small holes in your tertiary structure of protein now in that small small gaps and the small small holes there can be certain functional groups this is your tertiary structure of protein in this tertiary structure of protein there were small small gaps there were small small gaps or pockets small small gaps or pockets yes pockets in the small small gaps or pockets there are certain functional groups there are certain functional groups in the pockets that is called as your active site okay crevices or pockets crevices or pockets in the structure of the in, the, in their structure for binding of the structure substrate in your structure of the protein in your pro see enzyme is a protein right in the structure it has certain crevices or pockets where your substrate in this particular gaps in this pockets or crevices your substrate will come and join substrate will diffuse substrate will diffuse will come diffuse and it will come and join in this pockets and those pockets or crevices is called as your is called as your active sites those are your active sites and these are very specific for substrates one active site will be very specific for one particular substrate they will not interchange like how one key can open one lock one key can open one lock just like that just like that one active site will have one particular substrate will come and join the active site and catalyzes the reaction at high rates so your 
enzymes will completely you know catalyze the reaction that is your active sites if you look at your dna polymerase if you look at the structure of dna polymerase it has your polymerase active site yes it also has active site where the substrate will come and join okay that is your active site now what are enzymes all enzymes are poly all enzymes are proteins there are some nucleic acids that behave like enzymes these are called as your ribozymes ribozymes are not protein they are rna enzymes they are rna enzymes the enzyme like any protein has your primary structure yes an enzyme will have a primary structure a amino sequence of protein an enzyme will well, enzyme like any protein will have secondary and tertiary structure yes an enzyme will have secondary as well as tertiary structure when you look at the tertiary structure you will notice that these at uh, that the backbone of the protein chain folds upon itself yes in tertiary structure the protein chain is folding upon itself it is making certain pockets and crevices the chain criss crosses itself and hence may, many crevices and pockets are made many small small crevices and pockets are made in the tertiary structure of protein one such pocket is called as active site one such protein one such crevices or pocket is called as active site an active site of an enzyme is a crevices or a pocket into which a substrate fits small crevices or a pocket active site where substrate will diffuse and come and join there okay thus the enzyme through their active sites catalyze the reactions at high rate at high rate it will catalyze the reaction an enzyme catalyzes differ fr differ from your organic inorganic catalyst students your inorganic catalyze a uh, catalyst will work efficiently at high temperatures at high temperatures inorganic catalyst will work very well but your organic catalyst your organic catalyst organic enzymes will not work very well in the high temperatures except except your enzyme which is obtained from your bacteria which grows in your high temperature conditions that is your thermus aquaticus thermus aquaticus produces an enzyme called as your tac polymerase tac polymerase can also be used in the high temperatures right high temperatures clear but one major difference here is inorganic catalyst work inefficiently at high temperatures and high pressure while enzymes get damaged at high temperature above 40 degrees when you go above 40 degrees the enzymes get denatured right however enzymes isolate from the isolate from your organisms who normally live under extreme high temperatures hot springs thermus aquaticus at high springs it is there hot vents and sulfur springs are stable and retain their uh, catalytic power even at high temperatures up to 80 to 90 degrees celsius the same like right, the same tac polymerase is used in your pcr cycle denaturation right in tac polymerase is used in your pcr cycle the thermal stability is thus an important quality of enzyme isolated from the thermophilic organisms that is such as your thermus aquaticus thermus aquaticus is a example here okay no let's understand how does the function happens how is the enzyme that is biological activity i told you i told you enzyme will increase the rate of reaction but by how much what so give me a number give me a number by how much it is increasing let me give you a picture let me paint you a picture now co2 plus water when you mix co2 plus water we get carbonic acid yes we get carbonic acid yes the same reaction the same reaction when it is happening without a catalyst the same reaction is happening without a catalyst this reaction will take place this reaction will take place that is without a catalyst 200 molecules without a catalyst 200 molecules of h2 
टू सी ओ थ्री कार्बोनिक एसिड इज प्रोड्यूस्ड इन वन आवर इन वन आवर टू हंड्रेड मॉलिक्यूल्स ऑफ सी टू एच टू सी ओ थ्री इज देर बट विथ कैटलिस्ट वेन एवर देर इज कैटलिस्ट एग्जाम्पल इज योर कार्बोनिक एन हाइड्रेस वेन एवर देर इज अ कैटलिस्ट लाइक योर कार्बोनिक एन हाइड्रेस दिस रिएक्शन विल बिकम फास्टर दिस दिस रिएक्शन विल बिकम अ लॉट क्विकर बाय हाउ मच इफ यू लुक एट द आंसर यूर इफ यू लुक एट द आंसर यू विल बी सरप्राइज before it was forming 200 molecules in 1 hour now it will form now it will form 6 lakh molecules 6 lakh molecules of h2co3 in 1 second at every second now at every second 6 lakh molecules of h2co3 is formed before without catalyst 200 molecules in 1 hour there is an increase of 10 million times 10 million times is the increase when we use a catalyst when we use a enzyme here when we use a enzyme 6 lakh molecules of h2co3 in 1 second that is the incredible power of your enzyme just like your incredible hulk it is the incredible power of your enzymes 6 lakh molecule in just one second just in one second clear now if you look at the ncrt ncrt is telling you a chemical reaction a chemical compound undergoes two types of changes yes a chemical reaction will undergo two types of changes one is a physical change one is a chemical change in the physical change there is no breaking of bonds there is no breaking of bonds but in chemical reaction in chemical reaction there is complete breaking of bonds see here a physical change simply refers to the change in the shape that is your ice to water right breaking without breaking bonds in a physical change there is no breaking of bonds this is a physical process another physical process is the change in the state that is when ice melts ice melts into the water now here when the water becomes water vapor these are also physical process however when the bonds are broken and new bonds are formed when the bond is getting broken and new bond is formed during the transformation this is called as your chemical reaction so what is a chemical reaction in your chemical reaction there is a breaking of bond and also formation of new bonds that is barium hydroxide plus h2o gives barium sulfate plus water that is the example given here the next point i want all of you to understand is the rate of reaction the rate of reaction here the hydrolysis the rate of physical or chemical process refers to the amount of product formed per unit time so what is the rate of reaction rate of reaction is nothing but amount of product amount of product produced per unit time that is the rate of reaction this rate of reaction can also be called as the velocity of reaction yes rate can be also called as velocity if direction is specified if there is a direction it is also your velocity now rates of physical and chemical process are influenced by your temperature among other factors rate of reaction can be influenced for example whenever there is increase in 10 degree celsius the rate will become double decrease in 10 degree celsius rate will decrease by no two times that is a general thumb rule is that rate doubles or decreases by half for every 10 degree change in the direction 10 degrees increase rate will become double 10 degrees decrease rate will become half half degree catalyzed reactions produced at the va rates vastly through uh, vast rates vastly higher than the uncatalyzed ones when an enzyme catalyzes the reaction are observed the rate would be vastly higher than the same for example we just learned the example we just learned is your reaction very slow 
that is 200 molecules of H2CO3 in one hour. But when the catalyst is added, six lakh molecules in one second. Six lakh molecules being formed every second. That is the power of your enzyme. The enzyme has accelerated the reaction rate by about 10 million times. But 10 million times the complete reaction has been increased here. The power of your enzyme is incredible indeed. There are thousands of types of enzymes, each catalyzed by a unique mechanical, chemical or metabolic reaction. A multi-step reaction, a multi-step chemical reaction when each of the step is catalyzed by a same enzyme. There are multi-step enzymes where we have enzyme, same enzyme can be there in every step. But we can also have different enzyme for every step. Example is your glycolysis. In case of glycolysis, for every step, for every step we have a different type of enzyme. That is glucose to pyruvic acid. In your glycolysis there is different type of enzyme for every step. Now, what are simple enzymes? What are simple enzymes? Students, is this part clear to all of you? Is this part too clear all of you? Are you understanding? See, I'm telling you, every line of NCRT I'm mentioning, every line of NCRT I'm mentioning to you. So hopefully you are also learning every line of NCRT today. Okay. Students, can we start with the next concept? That is your simple enzymes. Simple enzymes consist of only one amino acid. Yes, simple enzymes have only one amino acid. Only amino acid, that is only protein. Simple amino acids will have only and only protein. They are very simple. Simple, sida, sada, only amino acid is there. But we also have something called as complex amino acid. We also have something called as complex amino acid. Also called as complex enzymes. We have something called as your complex or conjugate enzymes. Now, simple protein, simple enzymes are like your normal humans. Simple enzymes are like your normal humans. But your conjugated enzymes, conjugated enzymes are like your superheroes, are like your super heroes, superheroes. Now quickly tell me one superhero, tell me fast. Any one superhero you tell me from the chat, I'll pick up one superhero. Is it Spider-Man or Superman? Tell me why any, anyone, any superhero tell me. Spider-Man, Superman, Batman, Green Lantern, Flash, any superhero you know. Tell me superhero, come on, tell me one superhero. I'll give you that example we'll take. Okay, let's take Spider-Man. Let's take Spider-Man. Your conjugate enzyme is like your Spider-Man. Conjugate enzyme is like Spider-Man. Your simple enzyme, right? Simple enzyme is like a normal human like us. We only have protein. We only, only have your protein. Okay. While your conjugate enzyme is like a Spider-Man. Your Spider-Man has two parts that is there is a part called as your apo enzyme which is the only protein part remember spider-man was a human before right there was a time when spider-man had no powers yes spider-man had no powers before that is your apo enzyme which is the protein part spider-man was just like us it was only protein part that is called as your apo enzyme okay that is biologically inactive. Your apo enzyme is biologically inactive. Why? Your Spider-Man, when he did not have any powers, was he able to go fight the criminals? No. He was not able to fight supervillains. He did not have any power. So just like your Sp Spider-Man before, it's called as apo enzyme, which, is, which has only protein part, they're biologically inactive. Now your Spider-Man got powers. Spider-Man got powers. That is your cofactors. A spider come and bit him, he got the powers. Cofactors are the powers. That is, it is the non-protein part. Cofactor is the non-protein part. So when the Spider-Man got the power, what happens? This activates the catalytic activity. With the powers now, with the powers, this will activate your apo enzyme. Like how Spider-Man got the powers, he was able to fight the crime now. Right? Once the Spider-Man got the powers, 
he was able to fight the crime so your apo enzyme plus the cofactor apo enzyme plus the cofactor that is enzymes sidekick plus the cofactor this cofactor will activate your apo enzyme your peter parker spider man did not have any powers before then he got the powers that is cofactor he became biologically active that is he got he was able to fight the crime yes that is it became biologically active now now students apo enzyme plus apo enzyme plus your cofactor is called as your holo enzyme it is called as your holo enzyme right apo enzyme plus cofactor that is complete and biologically active this is your final spider man who uh, who has all the powers that is it has cofactors it also has a protein part that is your apo enzyme clear to all of you is it clear to all of you apo enzyme is a protein part right apo enzyme is a protein part a protein part is not biologically active at all it is not biologically active but your cofactor cofactor is a non protein part it will activate your apo enzyme and when your cofactor plus apo enzyme they come together they form the holo enzyme they form the holo enzyme complete and biologically active when holo enzyme is apo enzyme plus cofactor it is completely biologically active now amazing now what are cofactors then what are cofactors cofactors i told you here cofactor is like super power cofactor is the non protein part which activates which activates your protein part now cofactors are of two types broadly speaking cofactors are of two types one is your metal ions other one is your coenzyme other one is your coenzyme now this metal ions can be your zinc zinc can be involved in lot of different experiments calcium can be involved in your activation of your lipase that is your metal organic part in your in your in, in your organic part we have the coenzyme we have the coenzyme and we also have the prosthetic part we also have the prosthetic type of your coenzymes now let's understand the metal ion or inorganic type of cofactors the example which is given in your ncert is the zinc zinc is a type of cofactor which is a metal cofactor which completely binds to the protein part which completely binds zinc tightly bound to the carbonic anhydrase yes zinc will bind to carbonate anhydrase also carboxy peptidase this zinc can bind with carboxy anhydrase or carboxy peptidase now this carboxy anhydrase and carboxy peptidase will be completely inactive without the zinc without the zinc they will be completely inactive as soon as the zinc is producing zinc is introduced they become completely active that is they become holo enzyme yes is your carboxy anhydrase also your peptide carboxy peptidase that is your metal ion example next one is your coenzyme here coenzyme in coenzyme we have example which is given here is nad plus or nadh nadh or nad plus is bound to lactate dehydrogenase now this nadh needs a particular cofactor now this particular cofactor is called as coenzyme the coenzyme for your nad nadh is nothing but your niacin the cofactor for your nadh is niacin and this niacin is a type of your vitamin is a type of your vitamin b i guess vitamin b essential for your components of your coenzyme so coenzyme example for your coenzyme is nad plus nad plus the co nad plus the coenzyme which is present in nad plus is niacin is your niacin okay then what about prosthetic groups and remember students 
This is the coenzyme, right? The coenzyme is very loosely attached. It is very loosely attached. Loosely attached to the substrate. Or loosely attached to your protein part. While your prosthetic groups are tightly bound. Prosthetic groups are completely tightly bound to the enzyme. Example here is, what is the example? Ha. Huh. Peroxidase and catalase. Peroxidase and catalase are two types of your enzymes which catalyze the breakdown of your hydrogen peroxide. The prosody group, the prosody group in a peroxidase is your heme group, is the heme group. If there is no heme group, catalase and peroxidase will not work. The cofactor here is, the coenzyme here is heme. Coenzyme is heme. Clear? That is the entire explanation of your cofactors. Clear? Any doubt in cofactors? If you have any doubt, when I make you read the NCID lines right, you will understand it better. Okay? When I make you read the NCID lines, you will understand it more and more better. Okay? Now, how do the enzymes do it? How do they work? How do enzymes work actually? Your enzyme, you have your reactants. Reactant is also called as your substrate. Remember that. Reactant is also called as your substrate. Reactant 1 plus reactant 2, we get the product. But is it so simple? Is it so simple that we have a reactant plus reactant 2, we get the product? No. In fact, there are multiple, you know, different steps inside. Such as your reactant 1 plus reactant 2 will give us a intermediate product. Reactant 1 plus reactant 2, we obtain a intermediate product. And this intermediate product has very high energy. It has very high very high energy very high energy that is intermediate state intermediate state and then we get the product here and this intermediate state is also called as your transition state also called as your transition state that is intermediate product before the product is formed before the final product we have the intermediate product that is your intermediate product which has very high energy. Now, I'll teach you one concept called as your activation energy. Next, I'll teach you a concept called as your activation energy. Understand the definition here. Understand the definition. The definition of activation energy is nothing but your average energy. Average energy difference. Average energy difference between average energy difference between substrates substrates and average energy between substrates and transition state transition state understand the definition understand the definition of your activation energy Activation energy is an energy, right? Average energy difference between your substrate and transition state. You might have learned some other definition, but this is your biochemistry definition. Average energy difference between substrate and transition state. Now, I told you transition state has very high energy. Reactants will have some energy. The energy difference between your reactants and the transition state that energy gap is there right between the difference between the energies that is the activation energy which is required by the reactants that is activation energy which is required by the reactants so what is activation energy activation energy is the energy difference between your reactants as well as transition state and remember transition state or your intermediate state has very high energy very high energy in your intermediate state that is the definition of your activation energy
activation energy that is reactant one reactant two when we have a enzyme which is coming here then we have the product now what is the function of enzyme show what is the actual function of enzyme when enzymes are present they decrease this energy difference I told you there is an energy difference between your reactants and transition state. Now what enzymes does? Enzymes will decrease this particular energy gap. Can you see this? Reactants and products. This is your transition state. This is the activation energy bonds are broken. Your, transition, your enzymes will completely reduce. Enzymes will completely reduce the energy gap. That is the function of your enzymes enzymes will reduce the activation energy imagine you're going to do high jump you're going to do high jump you'll go run you'll try to jump and you will succeed now what if the bar is this height what if the bar is this height you go and try to jump over it you're not able to jump now you will then the enzyme will come enzyme will come and it will decrease the bar length itself if the bar length is decreased will you be able to jump easily yes that is what is happening. The act, so now catalyst is added. Activation energy for catalyzed pathway is less than the uncatalyzed pathway. So catalyzed energy will be decrease. Okay, your energy difference between your reactant and transition state. The energy differences decrease. Activation energy is the energy required to. Activation energy is completely decreased by your enzyme. Okay, so your substrate is there. Substrate is your reactant. Substrate plus enzyme will give you a enzyme substrate complex. See, here this is your substrate or this is your substrate. Substrate will come and diffuse and attach to the enzyme which will give you enzyme substrate complex. Enzyme substrate complex. Yes, enzyme substrate complex. This is a transition state. Then we have your enzyme substrate complex now this will give you enzyme product complex now this enzyme product complex will again split open where enzyme will come separately and product will come out separately that is we have your product plus enzyme separately if if i have to summarize the entire thing we were learning reactant 1 plus reactant 2 is giving the product now we know we include an enzyme so when we include the enzyme, what do we have? When we include the enzyme, enzyme will react with the reactant or the substrate which will produce your enzyme substrate complex. Now this enzyme substrate complex will get converted to your enzyme product complex and later on from this enzyme product complex, product is removed out and enzyme is removed. And a structure which is not consumed in the reaction. Your enzyme is not consumed in the reaction. That is why towards the end of it, we will get the enzyme back. We will get the enzyme back. See here. Now, we have chemical reactions. All of us know there is endothermic reaction and exothermic reaction. All of you know that we have endothermic reaction and exothermic reaction. What is endothermic reaction? Endothermic reaction where is a energy heat is needed endothermic reaction where energy is needed so heat is absorbed yes in exothermic reaction heat is liberated heat is released in the case of your exothermic reaction now i will teach you now i'll teach you exothermic and endothermic in terms of your reactants and products listen to me very carefully now listen to me very very carefully in endothermic reaction, in the case of your endothermic reaction, the energy of the product is higher. The energy of product is higher compared to reactants. That is why reactants will absorb. Reactants will absorb the energy. They will under reach the activation energy. Then they will form the products. But in the case of your exothermic reaction, Reactants energy is higher compared to your products. Reactant energy is higher. So what will happen? Once it reaches activation energy, it will lose the heat. 
heat of reaction is losing and then we get the product then we get the product that is why it is called as exothermic reaction exothermic reaction heat is released your reactants are losing the heat and they are forming the product clear in endothermic reaction reactants are absorbing the heat and they are forming the products that is the meaning of your endothermic reaction as well as exothermic reaction is that point clear to all of you is that point clear to all of you tell me fast in the chat if you look at this graph also we have your progression of reaction reaction is happening then we have potential energy potential energy is stored in the is a store form of energy which is present in your bonds first we have substrate <coughs> then we have product here <coughs> we had a huge transient state there was an energy gap the energy gap is called as your activation energy activation energy without enzyme now what does enzyme do enzyme is decreasing the activation energy activation energy with enzyme see less activation energy so enzyme substrate is becoming product easily it is becoming product easily okay see here enzyme plus substrate enzyme substrate complex then we get enzyme product complex and finally your enzyme and product are separately released out enzyme and product are separately released out here now the catalytic activity of enzyme action can be described in the following steps what is the first step first the substrate binds to the active site of the enzyme yes enzyme has an active site on that active site substrate will diffuse substrate will diffuse and come and join the enzyme where on the active site fitting into the active site first step second step is what the binding of the substrate binding of the substrate induces the enzyme to alter its shape the enzyme will alter its shape and fitting more tightly around the substrate that is when the substrate was attached first when substrate was attached first it was very loosely attached later on what happens the enzyme will modify itself and it completely joins the substrate enzyme substrate complex is very tight now okay the active site of the enzyme now is in close proximity of the substrate substrate breaks the chemical bond of the substrate and the and the new enzyme product is complex is formed from enzyme substrate complex we get enzyme product complex the enzyme releases the product of the reaction and the free enzyme is ready to bind to another molecule so remember in ever your enzymatic reaction enzyme is not consumed enzyme it is always free to go in the end okay now can you solve this question take 10 seconds to solve this question 10 seconds solve this question the question is very simple the question is very very simple here the question is telling you in a reaction catalyzed by enzyme which of the following statement is correct they are asking you a correct statement here options are enzyme decrease the activation energy for the formation of transient state enzymes make the transient state more uh, when enzyme make the transi transition from the substrate to the product more difficult enzymes increase the activation energy forming the formation transition enzyme substrate complex formed during the reaction lasts for a very long time see remember all these enzyme substrate complex are very very short duration the answer is very simple enzyme decreases the activation energy for for formation of transition state so what is uh, what is activation energy activation energy is the energy difference between your energy difference between your reactants as well as the transition state your activation energy will come enzyme will decrease the activation energy now the last part of the chapter the last part of the chapter is your last but one is your factors affecting your enzyme activity so we have multiple factors we have multiple factors as your temperature ph substrate concentration enzyme concentration we also have certain inhibitors 
we also have certain inhibitors. Now, how does temperature play a role? Temperature has fixed role. Whenever there is good temperature, whenever there is optimum temperature, enzyme will work properly. Yes, enzyme will work properly. Narrow range of temperature at which the enzymes are active. That is optimum temperature, maximum activity of the enzyme. Now, what if, what if I decrease the temperature? The enzymes will become completely inactive. And what if I increase the temperature? If I increase the temperature, enzymes are proteins. Proteins will completely denature. That is high temperature denaturation, low temperature temporary inactive stage. Completely inactive stage. Now what about pH? Again, every single enzyme is sensitive to pH and every single enzyme has something called as optimum pH. For example, if you look at this graph here, your pepsin will work best at pH 2. Pepsin will work at pH 2. Then your salivary amylase will work at your 4 to 5. Salivary amylase will work at 4 to 5 pH. Then we have your alkaline phosphate which will work at your 9 or 10 pH. So every single enzyme has that one particular pH where they are best they were their optimum, they will perform the best function. Okay, that is your optimum pH. Where optimum pH, maximum activity. Then we have substrate concentration. So what is substrate concentration? So initially, if you look at the graph here, initially we have certain enzymes and some number of, some number of substrate. Now substrate concentration is less. Substrate concentration is less. But as we increase the substrate concentration, as we increase the substrate concentration, more and more substrate is attaching to the enzyme. Yes, at one point, at one point we'll reach, at one point we'll reach where how much number of, you know, you keep on adding substrate, there will no more be increase in the rate of reaction. Yes, initially there will be an increase. Initially there will be See this reaction rate. Initially, there will be an increase in react reaction rate as we increase the substrate concentration. But at one point, at one point, how much ever you increase, how much ever substrate you increase, the rate is constant. <coughs> the rate become constant at one particular substrate concentration. Initially, it will increase. Rate will increase as substrate concentration is increasing. But at one point, it becomes completely constant yes will become extremely important clear now here we have a concept here we have a concept of v max and half v max now what is this v max v max is nothing but v max is nothing but i'll write down here v max is nothing but maximum velocity maximum velocity at which all active sites all active sites are filled here I told you here as we are increasing the substrate concentration active sites are filling active sites are completely filling up there what is v max v max is the maximum velocity at which maximum rate of reaction at which all the active sites of the enzymes are completely filled up that is your v max that is your v max here and v max here v max now but what is half v max half v max is nothing but half the velocity half the velocity at which all the active sites are completely filled. What is half V max? Velocity at which half of the active sites are filled. Half, half, half V max is, see this, V max is very difficult to measure. V max is very difficult to measure. That's why we measure the half V max. Half V max is the, here, rate at which rate at which half the half the number of active sites are completely filled should i write it down should i write it down tell me first 
how we max velocity at which make sure write down here velocity at which half of active sites are filled now here we have something called as Michele constant that is km now this km is very special this is km is nothing but km is nothing but concentration concentration of substrate concentration of substrate at half v max concentration of substrate here at half v max what is happening at half v max half of the active sites are completely filled right and that at that half v max we have a km value km value is the concentration of your substrate at half v max that is your half v max clear now i'll tell you a simple question simple question is very simple we have two graphs here we have two graphs again this is substrate substrate concentration substrate concentration here we have your rate of reaction or the velocity here we also have the also we have the velocity now this enzyme is working this enzyme is also working but this enzyme half v max is this is your complete v max this is your half v max this is your km value this is your km value now we have one more same here we have v max then we have your uh, one second this is your half v max this is your km value now here can you, now i'll ask you a simple question i'll ask you a simple question here is which enzyme which enzyme is functioning better which enzyme is functioning better or which enzyme is better here simple question is enzyme a better or enzyme b better this is 0 1 2 3 0 1 2 3 the enzyme which is better here is your option number a why option number a is better here why this enzyme is better because a good enzyme a good enzyme will have will have less km value a good enzyme will have less km value what is the meaning of km value the meaning of km value is the subset concentration now this particular enzyme is reaching half v max at just this substrate it is using very less substrate it is using very less substrate but if you look at the enzyme number b it is using more substrate to reach half v max now enzyme a is working so well it is using very less particular uh, substrate and work is done here okay all the active sites are filled you don't need to add more and more substrate here enough of substrate half v max is achieved so this is more better this is more better now we understand next we have enzyme concentration enzyme concentration is just like your substrate concentration as we increase the enzyme concentration initially the rate will increase but at a particular point the rate will become stagnate how much of an enzyme you add the rate will not increase just like your substrate concentration just like your substrate concentration the next topic here is your the next topic here is inhibitors. 
the next topic here is inhibitors now what are inhibitors inhibitors are chemicals that shut off the enzyme activity they completely block the enzyme activity here in other words inhibitors inhibit the enzyme activity for example this is your enzyme we have your substrate is coming and adding but what happens sometimes sometimes what happens this inhibitor will come and join here if inhibitor is joining here the active site this was active site the active site will completely change active site will completely change if the active site is changing the substrate is not able to bind anymore if the substrate is not able to bind anymore that's all the enzyme will not be able to work yes that is the thing which is happening right that is the thing which is happening now in your inhibitors we have three types inhibitors we have three different types of inhibitors hello i can see more people are joining here inhibitors we have three types one is your competitive inhibitor one is called as your non competitive other one is called as uncompetitive now what is the difference here difference here is very simple here competitive inhibitor listen to me very carefully in case of your competitive inhibitor they resemble the substrate competitive inhibitor they resemble substrate and they fight they completely fight with the substrate to join into the enzyme look at the diagram here look at the animation here you have your let the animation start we have your enzyme and substrate enzyme and your enzyme your inhibitor and your see this was your substrate your substrate will look exactly like your inhibitor inhibitor will look exactly like your like your substrate now instead of instead of substrate going and joining inhibitor instead of substrate joining with the enzyme inhibitor is joining instead of we see whenever enzyme and substrate are joining we get enzyme substrate complex when enzyme and substrate are joining we get enzyme substrate complex but in the case of competitive your enzyme is not joining your inhibitor inhibitor joining we are getting enzyme inhibitor complex we are getting en enzyme inhibitor complex in the case of competitive we are getting competitive so that competes with the substrate for active sites complete active will it will fight with the substrate for the active sites here clear i hope that is clear to all of you next ha huh. enzyme example 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 the example here is your uh succinate dehydrogenase yes the example here is your succinate succinate getting converted to your fumarate succinate getting converted to fumarate the enzyme here involved here is succinate dehydrogenase the enzyme here is succinate dehydrogenase now we have a inhibitor now we have a inhibitor called as malonate now this particular inhibitor this particular inhibitor will fight with the substrate this inhibitor will fight with your succinate to form a bond with your enzyme that is succinate dehydrogenase that is the competitive inhibitors this is the competition it is fighting a competition with your succinate clear now here this is very important this is very very important here now in the case of your competitive inhibitors can you see the v max is remaining same yes v max is same here v max is same but without the competitive inhibitors without without inhibitors this is the graph but with competitive inhibitors what is happening if your inhibitor is going and joining inhibitor is going and joining with your substrate right what happens substrate concentration the substrate concentration will completely decrease here that is no no it will increase sorry sorry v max will remain the same 
Vmax will remain the same here. And your Km value, this is your, take this is your half Vmax. This is your half Vmax. Half Vmax is here for before. That is without width is here. This is your width. This is your Km value. The Km value has increased here. So with, with your competitive inhibitors, the Km value has increased. The substrate concentration has increased now. Can you see? Sub half Vmax, Km value has increased. Before it was here. Before it was Km value was here. Now with your with your with with your competitive inhibitors, substrate concentration is what Km value has increased. Vmax is same, but your Km value has increased. That is your competitive inhibitors. Then we have something called as non-competitive inhibitors. Non-competitive inhibitors very simple. They bind at the site other than the active site. Apart from the active site, they will go join from the behind. From the behind, they'll come and join. See here, this is your this is your substrate. This is your enzyme. Now this inhibitor will come and join here and it will completely change. It will completely change the active site. Once the active site is completely modified, now your substrate is not able to join. Yes, it changes the shape of the active site such that the substrate is not able to bind. Very cunning. It is very, very cunning. It will completely modify the enzyme, your inhibitor. It can bind to free enzyme or enzyme substrate complex. Now this inhibitor in the case of non-competitive, in case of non-competitive, it can bind to free enzyme directly to the enzyme or it can also bind to the enzyme substrate complex. If it binds to enzyme substrate complex, the substrate will be removed outside. That here, listen very carefully. Listen very, very carefully here. In the case of your non-competitive, in the case of your non-competitive, if your enzyme is only getting modified, if the enzyme itself is getting modified, will the reaction decrease or increase? The enzyme is not functioning properly, so the Vmax will obviously decrease. Yes, here, if the enzyme is not working properly, the enzyme is less now, so Vmax will decrease. Vmax will completely decrease. Now what about the Km? The Km value will remain the same. The Km value will remain the same. Km value remain the same. Because concentration of substrate is still the same. Concentration is the still the same. Hello Vignesh, you can ask me the doubt fast. You can ask me a doubt. In uncompetitive, in the case of your uncompetitive, now this is a little gimmick. This is a little gimmick. What happens in your uncompetitive? In the case of your uncompetitive, right? It binds to the enzyme at site other than the added site. Same. But here, it cannot bind to the free enzyme. Uncompetitive, it does not want to compete at all. Whenever there is free enzyme, it does not bind to it. Whenever there is enzyme, you know, enzyme, enzyme separate complex, whenever there is enzyme substrate complex enzyme substrate complex see now it will not bind once your enzyme your substrate is binding then it will come and bind here the your uncompetitive enzyme inhibitor will bind only to your enzyme substrate complex not to the free enzyme it will not bind to the free enzyme it will only bind to the enzyme substrate complex see this enzyme it will not bind first once your enzyme is forming and complex is forming, then it will come and join, then it will kick it out. Then it will kick out the substrate. Then it will completely kick out the substrate. Clear? Let's read the NCRT lines. Here. The activity of enzymes cannot, can be affected by change in the conditions which, all, which can alter the tertiary structure of your protein. This includes your temperature, pH and change in substrate concentration or the binding to a specific chemical that regulate the activity that is your nothing but your that is nothing but your inhibitors so when will you teach the cell unit of life 
cell unit of life i will teach don't worry i think next i'll teach you plant kingdom after plant kingdom i'll teach you cell the unit of life okay now here enzymes generally function in a narrow range of temperature and ph each enzyme shows its highest activity at a particular temperature called as optimum temperature and a ph called as optimum temperature and optimum ph activity declines both below the and above the optimum value below the optimum value above the optimum value activity will decrease now low temperature preserves the activity preserves the enzyme in a temporary inactive stage if the temperature goes down enzyme will be an in inactive stage if the temperature goes really high the enzyme will completely denature whereas the high temperature destroys the enzymatic activity becomes proteins are denatured by heat right now with the increase in substrate concentration very important line listen very carefully with the increase in substrate concentration the velocity of the enzymatic reaction raises at first substrate concentration is increasing substrate concentration is increasing as the substrate concentration is increasing reaction is also increasing at first only at first the reaction ultimately reaches the maximum velocity vmax which is not exceeded by the further rise in concentration of the substrate after once the vmax is achieved the maximum velocity at which all the active sites are filled up no more increase in substrate concentration will affect the reaction vmax is the maximum after that the reaction will not happen reaction will become constant okay this is because the enzyme molecules are fewer than the substrate because all the enzymes all the active sites are completely filled up now and after saturation of these molecules there are no more free enzyme molecules to bind with the addition of substrate molecules now activity of the enzyme is also sensitive to your presence of specific chemicals that bind to the enzyme when the binding of the chemical sheds off the enzymatic activity it completely destroys the enzymatic activity that is called as your inhibitors <coughs> that is called as your inhibitors now when the inhibitors closely resemble the substrate when the inhibitor closely resembles the substrate it is called as competitive inhibitor molecular structure and inhibits the activity of the enzyme it is known as competitive inhibitor due to its close structure and similarity with the substrate your inhibitor will look like your substrate it will go cheat the cheat the uh, enzyme it will go and bind substrate poor, poor substrate will separate poor substrate will be separately somewhere okay the inhibitor competes with the substrate for the substrate binding site of the enzyme that is the active site consequently the substrate cannot bind and as a result the enzyme action decreases enzyme action is decreasing inhibition of the succinate dehydrogenase by the malonate so inhibition of succinate dehydrogenase enzyme by your malonate which closely resembles the substrate succinate so succinate doesn't get converted to fumarate instead of succinate malonate will come and fight with succinate for the enzyme succinate dehydrogenase such competitive inhibitors are often used in the control of your bacterial pathog pathogens this is a previous in equation this line here the last line also is a need pyq which type of inhibitor is there competitive inhibitor can be seen in the case of your bacterial pathogens see here this is your optimum ph optimum temperature and then we have your half vmax vmax this is the km value this is the km value let's have a question here we have a question here you have a question about your z scheme uh silo silo right below can you please type a question in the comment box i'll reply to it personally any doubt regarding this chapter or any chapter you can ask me in comment section sir this chapter there is any additions to the topic there is no additions 
Honestly, this NCRT reading with you is useful. That is the main reason we are doing NCRT reading. So that all of you can understand. Which of the following statements regarding the which of the following statements regarding the enzyme inhibition is correct? Competitive inhibitor is seen when the substrate competes with the enzyme for binding in binding to the inhibitor protein. Competitive inhibitor is seen when substrate and inhibitor compete for the active site on the enzyme. Non-competitive inhibitor of an enzyme can be overcome by adding large amount of substrate. Non-competitive inhibitors often bind to the enzyme irreversibly. Answer is very simple. That is option number second. That is competitive inhibitor seen where the substrate are Substrate and inhibitors compete for the active sites on the enzyme. They active, they fight for the active sites on the enzyme. Clear? This is a neat PYQ. Neat previous year question. Next question here. Malonate inhibits the growth of the pathogenic bacteria by inhibiting the activity of. In inhibiting the activity of. Malonate will join to which enzyme? Malonate will join to which enzyme which decreases which is which is growth of the pathogenic activity. The answer is very simple that is your succinate dehydrogenate. It will join with succinate dehydrogenase completely decrease the activity. Okay. This is also a neat PYQ. Neat previous year question. Clear? There's one more question here. Low temperature preserves the enzyme in a temporary inactive state. Yes, low temperature will preserve the enzyme in a inactive state. Whereas high temperature destroys the enzymatic activity because proteins are denatured by heat. First statement. Second statement is when the inhibitor closely resembles the substrate. Inhibitor is closely resembling your substrate. In its molecular structure and inhibits the activity of the enzyme, it is known as competitive inhibitor. I'll give you 10 seconds to answer this question. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Both the statements. Here, both the statements are absolutely correct here. Both the statements are correct here. Okay. Here, both statements are correct here. Now, last part of the chapter, five minutes, I'll be done. What is the chap last part of the chapter? Last part of the chapter is nothing but your nomenclature. Your International Union for your Biochemistry, IUBN. International Union for Biochemistry has given different types of enzymes. That is, we have based on type of chemical reaction it catalyzes. Based on the chemical catalysis it does, enzymes are further divided into your oxidoreductase, transferase, hydrolase, lyase, isomerase and as well as ligase. First one is your oxidoreductase, also called as your dehydrogenase. Here, a redox reaction is happening that is catalyzes oxidation reduction reaction. Here, these enzymes are involved in your Redox reactions also called as your oxidation reduction reaction. Example, the pyruvate getting converted to your acetyl-CoA. The enzyme here involved here is your dehydrogenase, right? Dehydrogenase. Dehydrogenase. Next one we have your transferase. They will help in transferring. That is your A, A, B is there. And then you have a seek reactant. What catalyzes the transfer of groups between the molecules. Then we get A, then B plus C. Simple transferase. Your transamylase. Right? Transamylase is an example. Transamylase as well as your amylotransferase is another example. Then we have hydrolase. It catalyzes the breakdown with the help of water catalyzes the breakdown of bonds by adding water. A plus B is completely broken down. That is A plus H will be formed here and B plus OH. B plus OH. 
that is your hydrolase example is your amylase amylase is an example then we also have pepsin yes pepsin is also an example here pepsin is also an example examples are not important examples are not important you need to know the functioning then we have lyase lyase is again breaking of your bond enzyme will completely break the molecule but without water now that is catalyze the breaking of the bonds without using the water without using the water then we have isomerase isomerase is basically helping isomerization for example we have 3 pga will get converted to your 2 pga yes in your glycolysis 3 pga is getting converted to 2 pga isomerization is happening isomerase then we have ligase which help in ligating like your dna ligase which will help in binding catalyzes the joining mo molecular by forming the bond like your dna ligase like your dna ligase clear this is the ncrt see here thousands of enzymes have been discovered isolated and studied most enzymes have been classified into different groups based on the type of reaction they are catalyzed enzymes are divided into six classes seen with four to five subclasses so in total there are six subclasses there and namely accordingly four digit number first one is oxidoreductase or dehydrogenase enzymes which catalyze the oxido reduction between the two substrates here then we have transferase enzyme catal enzyme catalyzing the transfer of your group that is transferring the group here then we have hydrolase enzyme which catalyzes the hydrolysis of ester ether or peptide or even glycosidic or halide and pn bond so basically they are breaking the bond with the release of water like in peptide bond formation yes you know glycosidic bond formation here then what is lyase enzyme that catalyzes the removal of group from the substrate by mechanism other than the hydrolyzing leaving the living double bond so whenever there is lyase whenever lyase is working there is formation of double bonds so isomerase includes all enzymes catalyze interconverting of the optical geometry or positional of isomers like 3 pga to 2 pga then we have ligase that is enzymes catalyzing the link together enzymes catalyzing the linking together of the two compounds that is the complete ligating clear now i told you in the last part some of you did not understand the cofactors let me tell you the ncrt lines of cofactors you will understand better enzymes are composed of one or several polypeptide chain however there are number of cases in which non protein part non protein part which is your non protein part is your cofactor constitute the called as cofactors are bound the uh, are bound to the enzyme to make the enzyme catalytically active that is apo enzyme is not active at all like your sp spider man without powers apo enzyme will be only active when your cofactor will come and join yes in these instances a protein portion of the enzyme is called as the apo enzyme protein part is called as apo enzyme plus the cofactor is called as holo enzyme these kinds of cofactors may be identified as a prosthetic groups or coenzymes or your metal ions your prosthetic groups and coenzymes are organic in nature and your metal ions are inorganic in nature prosthetic groups are organic compounds here and are distinguished from the other cofactors in that they are tightly bound i told you prosthetic groups are tightly bound to the apo enzyme they are tightly bound to the apo enzyme for example peroxidase and catalase which catalyze the breakdown of your hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen the hem group the hem group is the co prosthetic group here the hem group is tightly bound to the catalase and your catalase and peroxidase so hem is the prosthetic group hem is tightly bound to the catalase and your peroxidase the hem is the prosthetic group and it is a part of the active site of the enzyme then we have coenzyme coenzyme are also organic compounds i told you coenzyme and prosthetic group 
बोथ आर योर ऑर्गेनिक कंपाउंड बट दे आर लूजली एसोटेड बट दर एसोसिएशन विद द अपो एंजाइम इज ओनली ट्रांजियंट दैट इज लूज अरेन्जमेंट दे हैव वेरी लूज अरेन्जमेंट विद द अपो एंजाइम प्रोस्टेटिक ग्रुप वेरी हाई अरेन्जमेंट वेरी टाइटली दे आर लॉक्ड यूजली अकरिंग ओनली ड्यूरिंग द कोर्स ऑफ द कैटलिस फॉर द मोड को एंजाइम्स सर्व एज को फैक्टर्स इन नंबर ऑफ डिफरेंट एंजाइम कैटलाइज रिएक्शन द एसेंशियल केमिकल कॉम्पोनेंट्स ऑफ मेनी को एंजाइम्स आर वाइटमिन्स मेनी को एंजाइम्स आर इन द फॉर्म ऑफ वाइटमिन्स एग्जाम्पल द को एंजाइम निकोटीन अडीनाइन डाई न्यूक्लियोटाइड दैट इज एन एडी एंड एन एडी प्लस कंटेन्स द वाइटमिन नियासन नियासन इज द को एंजाइम श्योर विच विल बी बाउंड टू योर एन ए डी प्लस और एन ए डी पी एच देन वी हैव अ नंबर ऑफ एंजाइम्स रिक्वायर्ड मेटल आयोन्स फॉर फर्दर एक्टिविटी विच फॉर्म्स द कोऑर्डिनेशन बॉन्ड विद द साइड चेन्स एट द एक्टिव साइट्स सो एट द एक्टिव साइट्स दिल फॉर्म अ सपरेट साइड चेन्स एंड एट द सेम टाइम फॉर्म्स वन और मोर कोऑर्डिनेशन बाउंड विद द सबस्ट्रेट सो दिस इज अ टाइप ऑफ एंजाइम राइट दिस इज योर मेटल आयोन they will form a coordination bond between your active site also your enzyme they will hold everyone together okay example zinc is the cofactor for the proteolytic proteolytic enzyme carboxy peptidase zinc is the enzyme for carboxy peptidase catalytic activity is lost when the cofactor is removed so if you remove the cofactor activity is gone from the enzyme which testify which uh, testifies that the they play a very crucial role in the catalytic activity of the enzyme very important that important is that line that is cofactors are extremely important now students that is the end of the chapter that is the end of the chapter the complete biomolecules in 5 hours we have done because 10 there were breaks 10 minutes break was there if you remove the break it is 5 hours okay now what is your job now your job is very simple i will tell you your job now i'll tell you what is your job your job is very simple what you need to do is here is what you need to do is first like the video okay then go to the more here go to the more and click on get seven year pyq question on this chapter click here you will get a login page here login and you can access the last 7 year pyq see in the class i made you solve some pyqs but if you go on and login here you will be able to get more number of pyqs now apart from that do you need 10 year pyqs again 10 year pyqs if you want to solve ncert base quiz click on this here quiz can start here quiz can start you don't have to go anywhere for anything PYQs, NCERT questions, notes, every single thing is available here. Close this ad and then you can start. Some stupid ad is there. You can close the ad here. It's not showing here. Close the ad and you can you can start the test. Then get access to questions from Fire and Info on Facebook. Different most famous books. You can get that also. But where will the notes be available? Notes will be available to in your. Notes will be available on the Telegram channel. Link will be given. Click on the link, download the notes. Because students, today's session you saw, there's so much of information. It could be your proteins, amino acids, carbohydrates, lipids, and your nucleic acids. Then we studied about your enzymes, metabolites. So many topics. If you want to solve so many topics, you need the notes, and notes are available on the Telegram channel. So let's see what are they you're saying. now students i have seen you don't comment a lot i have seen you all have become very confused in commenting and also well as your liking see if you like the video the video will go to many students more and more so students also let me know in the comment section today three things if you have any doubt if you have any doubt let me know in the comment section if you do not have any doubt please type biomolecules done and dusted i want to see everyone in the chat to type me in the comment section biomolecules done and dusted and also let me know in the comment section how was today's class how was today's amazing class you can see my energy was a little low today because i was not feeling well today i thought i'll cancel the class today i was not feeling a little well 
but I wanted to finish the chapter at any cost. That is why when I'm talking sometimes, I'm stuttering more today because I was not feeling well. So, but I thought I'll take the class, finish the biomolecules because Saturday we'll be doing your human reproduction. We'll be doing your human reproduction. Cool then. Can we stop? Okay, then all of you go sleep now and uh, have fun. I will see you in the next class. Take care. Bye-bye students.